What's going on guys, Dots Gaming here, and today I'm bringing you guys my updated complete beginner guide for the Elsewhere chapter of the Elder Scrolls Online. I like to update this guide every single year when ESO releases a new chapter because of the huge influx of new players that come to the game. A lot of times the new players come to the game, I know at least for me, when I first started, they you find the game very confusing, ESO has a lot of different aspects, there's a ton of different content to cover, and you're not entirely sure where to start looking for information or how to figure out this big game that you've just joined and that is what this complete beginner guide is for this guide covers basically every single thing you could possibly ever want to know as a new player and this video alone will bring you in terms of knowledge from a beginner player to an intermediate player now i know a lot of people are going to look at this and say this is an extremely long guide it's incredibly long blah 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 i get it every single year but this guide is not meant to be sat down and watched in one session i know that you know there have been some people that have done it but this guide is intended to be sort of like a handbook for the elder scrolls online so while you're playing if there's something that you're confused on or if you want to learn more about you can pull up this guide click the timestamp of the section that you want to learn more about watch that section learn what you want to learn and then continue adventuring but if you want to go into the game filled with to the brim with knowledge you're more than welcome to watch this in one session but as you can see on the screen right here we do have the timestamps for the different section and they are also pinned in the comments below so you guys can check the pinned comments and skip around to the different sections i also do want to mention while we are here in this intro that i do have a website dotsgaming.com filled with different guides builds and information pertaining to the elder scrolls online so once you've watched this video and maybe checked out some of the other content on my youtube channel feel free to navigate over to my website to learn more about the Elder Scrolls Online. But enough of me talking about the intro, guys. Let's get right into the ESO Complete Beginner Guide for the Elsewhere patch. The Elder Scrolls Online runs off of a buy-to-play model. Simply purchase the game and you will have access to all of the content based off the version you purchase. No sub-fee is required. There is, however, a subscription that you can purchase for some extra convenience perks as well as a cash shop, but none of these are paid to win and we will go over what are in these in the next section. But, like I said, ESO is just simply buy-to-play, you buy it, you have it. ESO has always been notoriously difficult to figure out how to purchase. I've actually had to re-record this section four times because I have been confused myself on how to even explain buying the game, and I've been playing it for a while now. So I'm going to explain to you guys how to purchase the game and what is included in each purchase. Now, you're going to see a lot of pre-purchase bonuses because I am recording this prior to Elsewhere's release, so do keep in mind that some of this stuff may not be here if you are watching this post-Elsewhere release. So... We obviously will have the standard edition of Elsewhere, which includes the Elsewhere chapter as well as the regular base Elder Scrolls Online game. Now, if you pre-purchase it, if you were to pre-purchase it, you would have also gotten Somerset and Morrowind, the two previous chapters, aka expansions to ESO. But most likely, I'd have to imagine that post-Elsewhere release, it'll just be the Elsewhere chapter as well as the base game. Uh, but if you read, you know, down here in this little paragraph, it will tell you specifically what is included. Now, the standard edition is what you need to buy if you do not have ESO already. You want to get the digital upgrade if you already have ESO. So the standard edition gives you access to the game itself. And then the digital upgrade upgrades your account from whatever level you're at to also include elsewhere. The collector's edition upgrade, the digital collector's edition upgrade includes that summer, the elsewhere chapter upgrade as well so again if you already have an account this is what you want to buy and it will also include some exclusive perks which will be listed below here and then we also have the digital collector's edition which is basically like the it's the standard edition but with the extra bonuses so you know the mount pets mementos emotes and outfit styles so if you want all of those extra perks that come with purchasing the collector's edition obviously for more money but you don't own the game yet, you want to buy this one. Now, you can buy it for PS4, Xbox One, or PC. But if you do choose to buy it for PC, I recommend you go through the ESO store. Do not go through Steam. Steam adds a secondary, unnecessary launcher to your Elder Scrolls Online experience. And if Steam ever has any issues, you will be locked out of playing. So you're better off just going straight through the ESO store. Now, let's say you don't want Elsewhere. There's nothing in Elsewhere that really interests you. You can 
upgrade your pre-existing account, assuming you already have an account, to Somerset, which will simply include the Somerset zone and, and that chapter and all of the stuff that came with that. Or you can get the Collector's Edition upgrade, which came with all of the other Collector's Edition perks that Somerset had. Now, if you want to buy everything at once, let's say you want to buy everything at once, you're coming to the game and you just want to purchase everything, you can get the Elder Scrolls Online collection. It includes the base game, Morrowind, Somerset, and the Gold Edition. Now, the Gold Edition is the Orsinium DLC, the Dark Brotherhood DLC, the Thieves Guild DLC, and Imperial City DLC. Now, for those of you who don't know, DLC are basically like small additions to the Elder Scrolls Online, while chapters are the big, more expansion-esque additions to ESO. So just want to make sure to clarify that type of jargon. And then finally, we just have the regular Elder Scrolls Online Standard Edition, which is simply the base game and the Morrowind chapter. So the most efficient way to purchase ESO, because I do get asked about this, if I want to purchase ESO, the most efficient way, everything, what's the best way to do it? The best way to do it would be to purchase the Elsewhere Standard Edition, as well as get ESO Plus, because ESO Plus includes all previous chapters and dlcs now i'm not 100 percent sure at the time of recording this if somerset will be included in eso plus they did include morrowind in eso plus when somerset was released so i have to assume they're going to do the same thing with somerset with elsewhere's release and include it in eso plus so buy the standard edition of elsewhere subscribe to eso plus and that'll give you access to everything if you just want to try the game i recommend getting the elder scrolls online standard edition relatively cheap gives you access to an absolute ton of content and you can dip your toes in the game to decide whether or not this is something you would like to play long term or not So as I mentioned in the previous section, the Elder Scrolls Online does have a premium membership that you can subscribe to if you want some extra perks, and it also does have a cash shop. Again, none of these things are pay to win, but they do make it worth the money. You do get a good bit of value from subscribing to ESO Plus if you do choose to. Now, again, it's your pretty much your standard $15 a month fee that gets cheaper as you spend um, more money to get like a longer subscription uh like a reoccurring subscription. So, you know, obviously the three months cheaper than the one month, six months cheaper than three months, etc. But these are the different perks that you get from ESO Plus. You gain full access to all DLC game packs. So anytime they release a DLC, not a chapter, elsewhere is a chapter, but the other three content updates that they release during the year so like the dungeon updates and the small story updates those are considered dlcs and as long as you're sub to eso plus you'll get instant access to those and you do not need to purchase them you also get unlimited storage for crafting materials i would say if there's one big thing about eso plus that you need to know is that you get a ton of storage that's the biggest thing that eso plus gives you is inventory management if you don't have eso plus i do have a guide dedicated to inventory management on my channel that you can check out but Honestly, this is called the craft bag, which is the crafting storage. It, this alone is worth the ESO Plus membership, and I would definitely, definitely a selling point for it. You also do get crowns per month that correspond to the number of, um, like how long you're subbing for. So for example, if you do a, a reoccurring subscription every month, you'll get 1650 crowns every month. But if you do three months, you'll get even more crowns every time it uh, renews. So basically you'll get the crown value. Like you'll get crowns equal to the amount of money that you spent every time it, you, you're charged. So on top of all of these perks, you also do get the crown value as well. You get double bank space for your account, 10% increase to gold and experience acquisition, 10% increase to crafting inspiration. Inspiration is simply the fancy word for crafting experience and trait research rates. I will go over trait research in a later section. You get double furnishings and collectible space in player housing. ESO does have a great player housing system and with ESO plus you can put double the amount of furniture in it. You're able to dye your costumes so you can put on different costumes in the game and you're able to change the color of those with ESO plus. You also get the double currency cap for transmutation crystals. I will go over what transmutation crystals later on, but it increases that cap from 100 to 200. And you also get some special crown store deals every single month. So you can get certain things for free, discounts on other items uh, in the crown store, etc. 
And obviously, there are there's a 365 day, 1167 a month, 180 day, 1299 a month, 90 day, 1399 a month, and 30 day, 1499 a month. Me personally, I always like to go for the three month recurrings. That's anytime I play a game that has a sub model, I like to go for the three month recurring. You get you save a little bit of money on your sub, but your sub isn't so long that if you ever do decide, hey, I want to cancel it. You're not you're like you're not out a crap ton of money. Like it's not like you bought you know a one year sub and you decide in let's say a March that you don't want to play the game anymore, and so you have this huge long subscription that you wasted all this money on. So you're better off, in my opinion, going for either the 180 or the 90. Now, besides ESO Plus, they also have a Crown Store. Now I know people immediately hear Cash Shop must be must be pay to win, but it's not. The Crown Store is literally all cosmetics and convenience items. Nothing pay to win. So, for example, we have some pets here. We have a uh, sword motif. We have uh, personality, which basically makes your character's idle animations look a certain way. Um, there's an ESO Plus deal <coughs> where you get a free statue. You can also get this outfit. You also have different houses that you could buy inside of the crown store if the crown store ever decides to load. You could buy your houses here in the crown store or you could buy them in game for gold. Again, if you go to wardrobe, there are other outfits you can buy. So you can buy this alliance hood rider outfit. There are mounts that you can buy inside the crown store. You can buy certain mounts in the game with gold, but a lot of mounts are sold in the crown store. So you can buy a bunch of different mounts in the crown store if you so choose. There's also non-combat pets. There are some other crafting things that you can purchase, maybe certain style outfits, uh, tokens to make your character's appearance look a bit different. So as you can see, this is all just appearance and convenience items. There's some utility stuff. Again, there's like experience scrolls. Uh, there are supply kits that include potions and food. So as you can see, nothing pay to win here. All stuff that can just help you with convenience and cosmetics in your Elder Scrolls Online journey. This section is going to cover the different races and factions in the Elder Scrolls Online. ESO is a tri-faction game. You have the Ebonheart Pact, the Aldmeri Dominion, and the Daggerfall Covenant. Now, the one question I always get asked by new players is which faction should I play? Thankfully, in ESO, faction doesn't really matter too much outside of PvP. So let's say you want to play the Ebonheart Pact, but your friend wants to play the Daggerfall Covenant. You guys can still play most of the content in the game together. You guys can quest together, raid together, do exploration together, even do battleground PvP together. But the only time that faction restrictions are in place is in the Cyrodiil Alliance War. You cannot play with people on opposite factions, obviously, in the Alliance War because the different alliances are obviously at war. So... That's the only time that faction really comes into play in terms of restricting on how you can play with others. Now, there are three races per faction with one neutral race. Now, if you do choose to purchase the Adventurer's Pack upgrade from the Crown Store, you're able to play any race on any alliance. But assuming you do not have that purchased, there are three races per alliance and one neutral race that can go on any alliance. So for the Daggerfall Covenant, we have Bretons, Orcs, and Redguards. For the Aldmeri Dominion, we have the High Elves, the Wood Elves, and the Khajiit. And for the Ebonheart Pact, we have the Argonians, the Dark Elves, the Nords. Now, finally, we also have Imperials, which can play on any single faction they want. But this does require purchasing the Imperial Race upgrade from the Crown Store. Now, one question I will get from people is, which race should I play based off of my class? Now, race in the Elder Scrolls Online actually doesn't matter based off of your class. It matters on how you choose to play the game. And there's four main types of ways to play your character. There is a physical damage dealer, aka stamina DPS, a magical damage dealer, aka magicka DPS, a healer, as well as a tank. And then I'm also going to mention races that you can choose for generally that will apply to any single role. Now, the best type of stamina DPS in the game are going to be Red Guards, Orcs, Khajiit, Wood Elves, Nords, and Dark Elves. 
with a also small shout out to Imperials because they could also do stamina physical DPS as well. For magical DPS, you have Bretons, High Elves, Khajiit, Argonians, or Dark Elves. For tanking, you have the Imperial race, Nords, Argonians, and those are like the, the three main tanking races. Assuming you do play, want to play on the Almary Dominion or the uh, the uh, Daggerfall Covenant, I'd say probably special shout out would go to Khajiit. Khajiit could definitely make a solid tank, as well as probably a Breton. Bretons would make a very solid tank choice for the Daggerfall Covenant. And then finally for healers, we have Bretons, Khajiit. And Argonians making your best healers. Also, I don't know if I said it, but shout out to Imperial as well for tanking. Imperials make amazing tanks. So that is basically how you're going to want to choose your race based off which role you choose to play. Uh, also, oh, I did forget. If you want to play, if you're not sure what you want to play in game yet, you kind of want to play races that can experiment with anything. I would definitely recommend Khajiit, Dark Elves, Imperials, or assuming you want to play the Daggerfall Covenant, most likely. Um, I'd say either Red Guard or Breton would probably be your best one of your best two general races for the Daggerfall Covenant. But anyway, as I was saying, that is your overview of the different races, as well as in what situ the factions, as well as in what situations you would want to choose these guys. The next thing that we are going to cover are the various classes inside of the Elder Scrolls Online. So coming with the Elsewhere patch, we now have six classes to choose from instead of five with the Necromancer being the new class added in the Elsewhere chapter. But the first one we are going to cover is a personal favorite of mine, and that is the Dragon Knight. So the Dragon Knight... Description is these skillful mastered arms use the ancient Akaviri martial arts tradition of battle spirit and wield fearsome magic that pounds, shatters, and physically alters the world around them. Dragon knights are exactly what they sound like. They are big knights that focus around different dragon aspects. So, for example, a lot of fire type damage. You have poison type damage. They can augment their defenses with dragon scales and spikes they can jump to, to opponents with dragon wings it's just if you want to feel like a dragon warrior then obviously dk is for you now i know some people might be sitting here just saying well dk sounds like it's just going to be a big tank and that's it the good thing about the Elder Scrolls Online is that every single class can fill every single role. So yes, you can heal on a Dragon Knight, you can do physical damage on a Dragon Knight, magical wizard type damage on a Dragon Knight, or be a big beefy tank. It is up to you. You can play every single class in all four different ways, but the Dragon Knight is exactly what it sounds like. We also have the Sorcerer. The Sorcerers can, sorcerers can use Conjuration and Destruction spells to hurl lightning bolts and create shark, uh, shock fields. We have Dark Magic to snare and stun and summon daedric combat followers from oblivion to assist them sorcerer is your stereotypical mage character for eso so as a magic damage dealer it's basically what you're going to expect lots of lightning attacks you can use pets if you so choose to um big burst damage lots of control that's what you're going to get from your magical sorcerer but you can also heal on your sorcerer you have a pet that can also help you heal in battle you can tank on your sorcerer as well and your physical damage dealer is going to uh, revolve around wind and those types of attacks wind and rocks instead of lightning and dark magic so that is what you're going to get from your sorcerer we also have your night blade yes you guessed it night blade is going to be your more stereotypically rogue type class class in the game. Night plays are adventurers and opportunists with a gift for getting in and out of trouble, relying on variously stealth, blades, and speed. Night blades thrive on conflict and misfortune, trusting their luck and cunning to survive. So your night blades are going to be your rogue, obviously, if you choose to play them like a physical damage dealer, your daggers and bows and whatnot. But if you choose to play it as a magical damage dealer, you're going to focus a lot on bloodbending and siphoning type magic. And you could also harness darkness itself for tanking or sacrifice your own life force to heal your allies. So Nightblades are a fun class for any role. We also have the Templar, which are exactly what it sounds like. Templars are your paladins and your priests for ESO. So these traveling knights call upon powers of light and burning sun to deal massive damage to their enemies while restoring health, magic, and stamina to their allies. So you basically use the power of the light to deal physical damage, magical damage, tanking, and 
healing. They all go about it in a little bit of a different way, but your Templars are literally just your stereotypical paladins and priests inside of ESO and can fill any role quite nice. We also have the Warden. Wardens are defenders of the green, master storytellers whose nature tales become magical reality. They wield frost spells against enemies and summon animals to fight them. So Wardens are going to focus primarily around frost magic, uh, nature magic, and pets. So as a Warden... You can harness power of frost while tanking, use the nature type heal over time spells when you're choosing to heal, and you have your different physical damage dealer and magical damage dealer that both deal really, really good burst damage and focus on that type of stuff. You have your stamina damage dealer has a ton of different buffs that they bring to a group, and you also have your magical damage dealer who can bring a lot of control and utility. So again, if you like the whole frost, uh, nature pet summoning type deal pets aren't mandatory but they are very good especially for uh environment content then warden is going to be for you now the new man on the block the necromancer added to the elsewhere chapter masters of death necromancers can call upon corpses to serve as undead thralls and weave ghastly spells to both harm and heal so your necromancer again is it's what it sounds like in the title you summon undead servants to do your bidding you can focus on poison and disease if you are doing uh, physical damage as when you do magical damage you focus on all of the elements as well as summoning wizards to fight for you when you're a uh, physical damage dealer, you can summon archers to fight for you when you heal you can use the corpses around you and siphon life from them to heal your allies and when you tank you can also become death itself and turn into a massive bone colossus and make yourself nearly impossible to kill so necromancers are the new class added very, very good in all roles, but there is a caveat. Using certain necromancer abilities in towns are considered a criminal act. Citizens and guards will react accordingly, and you may even become a kill on sight if you do certain things in a city that the townsfolk might not be too happy with. But it does tell you on those necromancer skills whether or not you are allowed to use it inside of a town or not, so just do be careful with that. But those are all the classes in ESO. Like I said, every class can tank, heal, or deal damage as physical or magical damage dealer. And uh, people always ask me, Dots Gaming, what is the best class for a new player? I recommend as a new player, playing whichever class you think sounds the coolest. I do not subscribe to the whole new player class idea. I, in my opinion, you are going to have a much better time and you are going to enjoy the game more if you play something that sounds fun and cool to you instead of playing something that you just think might be easy and then weeks or months down the line, you might not even like the class anymore and once you've learned enough about the game and you will have want to play something, you will have wished that you played something else. So in my opinion, Pick whichever class you think sounds cool and really fun and level up and create that class. Also, feel free to check out my website, dotsgaming.com, for leveling builds for all of these characters. So if you're starting from level one and want to level throughout the whole game, I have setups that you can follow to make sure that you're leveling up in an efficient manner. But definitely make sure you watch this video first so that you understand all the different things that are covered in that guide. The next thing that we are going to cover is character creation and what you can expect when you are creating your character for the first time in ESO. So as I went over in the previous sections, we have the alliance you can choose as well as your race and obviously you can choose a gender, male or female. You then can select whichever class you want to. I did go over the classes in the previous section and then you can move into your character customization from there. So you have your different body type triangle slider so you can move this around to make yourself as thin, large or muscular as you want. You can make yourself super tall or super short. You can change your skin color, add body markings to your character if you'd like, tattoos, scars, really up to you. You also can adjust tons of different stuff about your upper body, torso size, chest size, gut size, waist, arm, and hands, as well as the dimensions of your lower body, such as hip, posterior, leg, and foot. Past just your body stuff, you can also edit your face. You have different face types from angular, soft, to heroic. You have different voice options that you can choose, so it'll basically determine what your character sounds like when they're yelling and grunting in game inside of combat as well as when they're laughing, crying, all the different emotes that uh, make character sounds. You also have different hairstyles that you could choose from, of course, hair colors as usual, age, you have different beards and, you know, 
Uh, this is, so for some characters, is earrings, eye patches, you know, depends a little bit on your race. You have different head markings, such as uh, tattoos and scars that you can add. And then, of course, you can get into the wide variety of facial sliders that you would like to, from your face to your eye color, your eyes, your eyebrows, your nose, your mouth, and your ears. And then finally, you can end up on a character name. Cannot start with a space, must end with a letter. No more than two of the same letter in a row. No numbers, no adjacent punctuation, uh, four hyphens, apostrophes, or spaces at most. And and no invalid characters. So that is just a quick overview of what you can expect from character creation inside of The Elder Scrolls Online. Once you create your first character, you will be sent right into the tutorial, or if you're creating a new character, you will be ha you will have the option to skip or replay the tutorial if you would like. Now, I'm not going to show the tutorial here for elsewhere because I don't want to spoil it for those who want to see it for their first time, but once you complete the Starhaven elsewhere tutorial, you will be spat out here. Now, a lot of people are going to wonder, what do I do next? What are my next steps? What is the next adventure on my journey? Well, the great part is that's really up to you and how you would like to tackle it. You can talk to Zamorak right here, and that quest line above his head means that it is a story quest for the zone. So you can start and talk to him and start the elsewhere story quest if you so desire, or you could do your faction slash uh, the faction quest line, or you can do the main story quest line for the Elder Scrolls Online, or go to any one of the other zones if you so choose. The beauty of ESO is that its questing journey is very sandboxy in nature. So assuming you want to go start the main story quest line of the Elder Scrolls Online, you're going to want to just go to basically any of the starting towns and you will get the hooded figure to come talk to you. So for the... Ultimary Dominion, you're looking at Volkhel Guard. For the Ebonheart Pact, you're looking at Davin's Watch. And for the Daggerfall Covenant, you're looking at Daggerfall. And when you first create a character, if you click the map, right-click to zoom out, you will see all of these way shrines, which are places that you can fast travel to. So let's say that I fast travel to Davin's Watch. When I get to that way shrine, I'm going to get a quest that tells me to talk to the hooded figure. The hooded figure will appear, and then I could talk to her and start the main quest line of the original Elder Scrolls story, which is the defeating of Molag Ball. Past that, you can also start one of your faction quests, and when I show you the hooded figure, I will show you where to go from there. So once you get to Davin's Watch and you start heading towards the town, the hooded figure will appear and you will get the Soul Shriven and Coal Harbor quest line. So simply talk to her, and you can start the Molag Ball quest line. Now, if you want to start any of your faction stones and you want to do them in order, there's just a couple spots you're going to want to start in. You're going to want to start in Canarthi's Roost for the Aldmeri Dominion. You're going to want to start in Bleak Rock Isle for the Ebonheart Pact. And you're going to want to start in Stros Mackay for the Daggerfall Covenant. And you will have way shrines to all of those places as a new character. You don't have to do those zones first to do the faction quest line but if you want to experience the faction quest lines in order those are going to be the places you want to go or you could also feel free to travel to vardenfell to start the morrowind storyline you can feel free to travel to somerset to start the somerset storyline the world is your oyster when it comes to questing in the elder scrolls online This next section is going to cover your user interface in the Elder Scrolls Online. So as you can see at the top of my screen, that is my compass. And when I look around, I can see the different directions, north, south, east, and west. I can see my current quest marker, uh, available quests, and other tons of icons. I can see the Way Shrine icon right in front of me in the top. There's just a bunch of different icons that if you hover your mouse over them on the map, you will be able to see what they are. For example, this is the Starved Plain area. This is Strife Swarm Aquarma Mine, Advent Exchange, a public dungeon. So if you hover your mouse over the different places, you can see what they are. But looking at the rest of your user interface, if you were on PC and you hit enter, you can see your chat in the bottom left. So you have access to your chat there. And then if you click a bunch of the different hotkeys, you can open up these menus here. So you have the crown store all the way on the left. And this is the cash shop that I went over earlier in the video. We also have crown crates, which are exactly what they sound like. They are loot boxes for ESO. Uh, they're still in at the time of making this video, but 
this offers nothing that you need. These are just mainly cosmetic items that you can try to roll for if you want. You don't have to. I really never buy crown crates, so this isn't anything you, you need to take part in. Uh, you can also deconstruct some of the crown crate items you get for gems and exchange those gems for items you want in the crown store So feel free to explore that if you so choose you also have your inventory This is your bags that you have access to so you can see all the different types of things in your bags Your gold as well as what items you have available on your character as well as a quick look at your stat sheet You can also do uh, navigate to the craft bag various types of currencies that you have as well as your quick slot menu Which I'll go over a bit later in the video. You also have your character sheet and this where you can find uh, your guy's name, your race and your class, the rating of your equipment, title, outfit, your alliance rank, which is your PvP rank. I'll go over that later in the video as well. We have your attributes, magicka, health, and stamina, as well as a more advanced look at your stat sheet, your current horse upgrade progress. Again, I'll go over a lot of these things later in the video, as well as any active effects you have on your character. You also have your skills. So you, you can see the different skill trees for your class, weapons, armors, world skill lines, any NPC guilds that you're in, the PvP skill lines, your Rachels, as well as any crafting professions, and do not worry, these will all be covered later in the guide. Same thing with the champion point system. This is your end game progression, so you can open this up to take a look at your champion point system. You also have your journal, which is your quest log, your lore library, so your list of lore books you've collected, any achievements, as well as various leaderboards. We also have collections, which is where you can find any upgrades you've purchased for your account, any appearances, uh, you can see head markings, head items or adornments, costumes, body markings, etc. Any furnishings, assistance, mementos, which are kind of like just little items you can use for cool effects and whatnot. They don't really do anything in combat, just some cool stuff that you can collect. You also have mounts, non-combat pets, emotes, as well as anything special you've acquired on your account. You also have the story, so you can see what stories you currently have access to. And if you would like to start those stories, you can click Accept Quest. So, for example, if I wanted to start the Merc Meyer DLC, I can click Accept Quest here and would get the quest, which would send me on my adventure to Merc Meyer. We also have housing, so any houses that I've collected, as well as ones that I have not, as well as the option to travel to them, and my outfit styles, if I wanted to equip any outfit styles to my character. I could preview them here, or I could equip them at an outfit station, but I will be covering that later in the video as well. We also have your map, which I've shown a few times. We have your group pane, so you can set your group's dungeon difficulty, look at any members in your group. You can show up the zone guide, which will also be covered later in the video. You can do your dungeon finder. The Alliance War queue, so if you go into Cyrodiil, you could look for some groups there. I don't really know at many people that use this, but it is there if you would like to. As well as you can queue for your Battlegrounds, which is your small-scale PvP, while the Alliance War is your large-scale PvP. You also have your friends list, so you can see your friends list here, as well as anybody that you have ignored. You have your guild pane, where you can see all of the guilds you are in. There are You can be in up to five guilds. You could also join or create a guild yourself. Uh, and you can do use the guild finder to search for various guilds in the game You also have the alliance war so you could see the different alliance war campaigns Which are just instances of the open world pvp zone that you could join but you can view that here You can open your mail See any notifications and check out the help menu In addition if you want to uh, see your abilities and your health bars while you're in combat i know a lot of people do ask me about that a lot you can go down to here combat you can do ability bar always show attribute bars always show so now whenever you are playing the game you can see your active abilities at the bottom as well as your health magica and stamina bars so that is a quick overview of your user interface in eso by the way you could also see any quests up here that you have currently active your active quest and then you will anytime you gain experience or gold or anything the uh like kind of like a little history will appear down here at the bottom right so that is what you can expect like i said from the user interface inside of the elder scrolls online
The next section of this guide is going to cover add-ons. Like most MMOs out on the market, you can install add-ons to the Elder Scrolls Online to change how your user interface looks and add some more functionality. But do keep in mind that this is for PC only. Consoles do not have access to add-ons, unfortunately, so this is going to be a PC only section. Now, I highly recommend if you want to browse and download add-ons for the Elder Scrolls Online, that you do it through minion.gg and download your that client and have it search for your add-on directory for the Elder Scrolls Online and use Minion to download add-ons. It is the most up-to-date and has way more add-ons than other add-on... Uh, like, you know, other add-on programs that you can use for the game. Minion is consistently the most up-to-date. And if you have any problems installing it and have any troubleshooting issues, I do have a guide on my channel called How To... Uh, how to install add-ons for ESO. So if you have any troubleshooting issues, you can go to that guide and check that out. But yes, you can download a ton of different add-ons for ESO, and I will also go over the different add-ons that I have if you want to know some, some good ones to start with. I'm just going to do a quick overview. I'm not going to go super in-depth here, but we have Action Duration Reminder, which displays a timer for the different skills on my skill bar. So, for example, if I use this buff here, you can see I now have 17 seconds, 16 seconds. So, it allows me to keep track of my various buffs and debuffs and the timers that I have for them. I have Add-On Selector, which allows me to make different add-on packs. So, if I want to go PvP, I have a pack for that. If I want to sell items, I have a pack for that. So, it allows me to load and unload add-ons with the click of a button. I have uh, Advanced Member Tooltip, which is just a Guildmaster add-on. You don't really need this. Uh, Assist Rapid Writing. There, you, there is a skill that you gain when you PvP for like one of the first times and you gain a couple alliance points called Rapid Maneuver. That basically just allows you to mount up and uh, make your mount speed much quicker. So you gain Major Expedition, which makes your movement speed quicker, and Major Gallop, which makes your mounted speed quicker. And that add-on will basically slot that skill in to your bars automatically when you hop onto a mount, and then when you use the skill, it'll automatically take it off your bars. Um, I also have Can I Horn, which is a more advanced uh, tanking add-on, so you might not need that as a new player. Champion Point Respec allows you to save champion point profiles. So there is no dual specking in ESO like there are in a game, like there is in a game like World of Warcraft. So using an add-on like Champion Point Respec allows you to save champion point profiles, and you can load different champion point profiles based off of what you're doing so you don't have to manually place those points every time combat metrics is the dps add-on of choice for eso so if you're looking for a good dps add-on combat metrics is the one to use dark ui is the add-on that's giving my ui this dark mode Dolgobin's Lazy Rit Creator is a crafting add-on that I definitely recommend downloading, and I will cover Ritz later on in the crafting section, but this will make doing Ritz extremely quickly. Uh, dressing Room basically allows me to load and unload gear and skill profiles, because as I said, there is no dual specking in the game. So Dressing Room will allow you to load up various sets of gear as well as skill choices with just the click of one button. It's an extremely helpful add-on. We also have... Gray Skull. Uh, Gray Skull is what I use to show my weapon damage at the bottom right here. So, or and now it just went away. But if you know, whenever my weapon damage goes up, you can see it increases along with it. So it just shows me how much damage I currently have on my character. Uh, Harvin's add-on settings came with a different add-on. We have Harvest Map, which basically, whenever you farm nodes around various zones, it'll basically leave a little marker there saying, hey, you farmed something here. Inventory Insight allows me to look into my inventory across all my characters. Note that you must log into all of your characters once in order to see this. I have a bunch of libraries that came with my various add-ons, and if you need more, you... Like, let's say you download an add-on that says, I need this library. You can go onto Minion and download the uh, library that is needed. I also have map pins, which places little pins on my map for lore books, sky shards, as well as other points of note. Lore books and sky shards you will learn more about later in the guide, but... Uh, this place is basically tons of icons in your map that shows you where certain things are, and you can, you know add or subtract as many different map pins as you want you can display as much or little information as, as you desire master merchant is what i use for the selling of items it'll basically pull in data from the various trading guilds i'm in i'll explain what that means later in the guide but it basically pulls in info about various sales of items and will basically uh, make a chart on the item tooltip itself to tell you how much an item is worth and how much you should sell it for. I also have multi craft, which allows you to craft multiple items at once. Uh, so let's say you're going to craft potions, right? Instead of having to press your 
key for potions every single time and continually click it and continually craft. You can just set multi-craft and make a batch of 20 and it'll automatically do it. Uh, raid buffs is a tanking add-on that I have. Uh, not really necessary. Raid Notifier is kind of like your go-to deadly boss mods type deal for the Elder Scrolls Online. So if you do plan on doing trials, which are raids, basically, Raid Notifier is going to be really important for you. I can skip these two. They're tanking specific. Ulrich, uh, Yurik Skill Point Finder is really, really good for finding where various skill points are uh, in the world, ones that you haven't collected yet. Skill points basically will allow you to unlock skills and passives. Again, I'll go over them a bit later in the video. But Yurik Skill Point Finder will show you what skill points you still need to acquire and so you can go out and do those. Uh, Votan's Keybinder basically allows you to make your keybinds account wide. Votan's Minimap is my minimap add-on that you have on, on the right side. Minimaps are not default to the game. Votan's Search Box adds a search box to my inventory, so I can click here and actually search my inventory. And then finally, I use Weapon Charger, which automatically charges my weapon enchantments whenever they run out. Uh, and by the way, if you ever see that these add-ons is like out of date, out of date, just simply select allow out of date add-ons and they will be able to run on your account. So those are what add-ons are. Like I said, they change up your game a little bit, add some extra functionality, download them through minion.gg, and you will be able to keep your add-ons completely up to date as well as search the most uh, latest and greatest database of add-ons that you have to offer. And remember, add-ons are PC only. The next thing that I'm going to cover are attributes as well as different types of builds in the game. So starting with attributes, we have three main attributes for the Elder Scrolls Online. We have Magicka, Health, and Stamina. And every single time you level up, you are able to get a certain amount of points to place in your attributes up until 64 points. So you can use Magicka to cast, obviously, skills that cost Magicka. You have health, obviously that is your health bar, and when you reach zero health, you die. And then you have stamina, which can also be used to cast skills, but stamina is also consumed when you do other things such as sprint. When you bash opponents, you sneak, roll dodge, or break free, or do other things in the game, stamina is spent doing that. Now you might be wondering, you know, how, what points, where should I place my points when I'm leveling up? Where you place your points when you're leveling up is going to be determined based off the type of build that you want to play. So most stereotypically, there are four main types of builds. There are tank builds, healer builds, stamina DPS, which are basically your physical damage dealers, and then magicka DPS, which is the jargon for your magical damage dealers. Now, if you are a magicka damage dealer or a healer, you want to place all 64 of your points into magicka. And you might be saying, well, why do I want to do that? That is because skills that deal damage or heal you will generally get stronger based off of the size of your resource pool that they cost. So for example, if you have a skill that costs Magicka, the larger your Magicka pool is, the more damage or healing that skill will do. And same thing if you're playing a stamina damage dealer. Um, if you're playing a stamina damage dealer, you're gonna wanna put all of your points into stamina because if you have a skill that costs stamina, it will deal more damage or heal you for greater amounts the larger that maximum stamina pool is. Now, for tanks, you want to kind of spread your resources over all three pools. Tanks generally kind of want a little bit of everything. You want some health to obviously make yourself a little bit beefier. You want enough stamina to make sure that you're able to block and do other things. And then you want Magicka to be able to cast your utility skills. So the amount of you're going to want to get from each of these three pools as a tank is going to vary based on your setup. So you can kind of play around with these numbers to see what you like. Or feel free to check out any of the builds on my website, dotsgaming.com, for an overview of, of where a lot of the builds on my website place their points. Now you might be wondering though, well, is there ever a situation where maybe as a stamina damage dealer, I would like to use a magicka skill or as a magicka damage dealer, I would like to use a stamina skill. And the answer is yes, there are situations where you would like to do that. Primarily, you will use skills of the opposite resource for the utility that they offer. So this character that I'm playing is a stamina damage dealer, but I still use the volatile armor skill that costs magicka for the buffs that it offers. It offers me major resolve and major ward, which increase my resistances, which are basically something that makes me tankier. I'll be explaining this in a later section, but 
resistances make you tankier and major resolve and ward are just standard buffs throughout the game they're not influenced by your magicka pool or your stamina pool it's a utility skill so it's not really a big deal that i'm spending magicka on it because it's not any weaker by costing magicka but as you can see there's a damage component to this skill when you release a spray of spikes around you cause enemies to take 48 48 magic damage over 10 seconds now this number would be much higher if my Magicka pool was much higher, you know? So at, right now, it's only about 5,000 because my character primarily has a larger stamina pool. But I have a Dragon Knight that also is Magicka focused, and this skill will hit for about 12,000 on that character. So because it costs Magicka, um, and that character has a larger Magicka pool, this the damage portion of this is much stronger now vice versa on my magicka dragon knight i will still use the rearming trap skill primarily for the minor force buff again as you can see major and minor buffs are not really affected by your resource pool so as you can see minor force increases my critical damage done by 10 seconds this is an extremely important buff for end game group play so i will still use a stamina costing skill for the utility it offers on a Magicka class. But in general, as a stamina class, you're going to want to primarily use abilities that cost stamina because they will be stronger the more stamina you have. And you could also cast more of them because your stamina pool is larger and vice versa on Magicka damage dealers as well as healers. Healer Healing skills are also strengthened by the corresponding resource pool. Uh, so that is basically an overview of the different attributes, how, where you want to put your points, as well as how damage scales based off your build type. The next section that I'm going to cover is damage scaling, mitigation, and status effects. So as we learned in the previous section for attributes, skills will deal more damage or heal for more based off the size of the resource pool of what the skill costs. So again, just to give you another quick example, my heroic slash costs stamina, so it will deal more damage the more stamina I have. Same thing with my resolving vigor. It will heal me for greater value based off the maximum size of my stamina pool. So if my stamina pool is really small, this won't heal me for a lot, but if my stamina pool is really big, this will heal me for more. But there are more things that will apply to your damage scaling besides your maximum resource pools. For example, magicka based skills are augmented as well by spell damage. So spell damage, as you can see, affects how much damage or healing your magicka based abilities and weapons cause. So weapon damage is then the opposite side of that coin. Weapon damage will affect how much damage and healing your stamina based abilities and weapons will deal. You also have weapon critical, which gives your physical attacks a chance to deal critical damage. And then you also have spell critical, which gives your magicka based abilities a chance to deal critical damage. And of course, you could take a wild guess, spell damage and magicka of type abilities are re, uh, mitigated by spell resistance. Decreases the amount of damage you take from magical attacks, just like weapon damage and stamina based skills are mitigated by physical resistance. Decreases the amount of damage you take from physical attacks. Also, critical strikes have their own mitigation as well called critical resistance decreases the amount of damage you will take when you are the victim of a critical strike do note though that critical resistance is not necessary if you are not fighting another player npc characters and bosses are incapable of critting only players can deal critical damage so if you are doing pvp in this game you want to make sure you have in my opinion at least you know assuming we're talking you know champion point type pvp which i'll get late to later in the video you want at least 2000 critical resistance if you're doing like a no cp so no champion point type pvp and you're maybe doing battlegrounds you want to make sure you have at least you know 1000 at the very minimum, 1,000 1, to 1,250 minimum uh, to make sure that you don't get hit very hard when a player deals critical damage to you. Now, besides the damage scaling and mitigation, there are also certain status effects that appear, appear in the game, and those are actually also augmented by your maximum magicka as well as your spell damage and take advantage from those stat types. So we have a three types of physical status effects and two types of stamina and one that's kind of like a miscellaneous one so we have the burning status effect which is a magical stamina uh status effect chilled and concussed are also magical poison and disease are physical with a special shout out to bleed as technically being a physical 
one as well. So burning, the burning status effect can be applied by dealing fire damage to a character. When you apply the burning status effect on an enemy, they take fire damage over time based off your max magic and spell damage, and burning lasts four seconds and ticks every two seconds. The chilled status effect can be applied by dealing damage, uh, frost damage to a character, and chilled enemies will suffer from minor maim debuff for four seconds, which reduce their damage by 15%. We also have the concussed status effect, which can be applied by dealing shock damage to a character, and a concussed enemy will suffer from minor vulnerability for four seconds, which will increase their damage taken by 8%. We also have the physical status effects. So the poison status can be applied by dealing poison damage. And when you apply this status effect, they will take a poison damage over time. Uh, they'll take poison damage over time based off your max damage and weapon damage. And this can last six seconds and occur every and will tick every two seconds finally we have the disease status effect which will be applied again by dealing disease damage and a diseased enemy will suffer from major defile for four seconds decreasing their healing received by 30 percent now weapon enchantments because you can add enchantments to your weapon so it basically will augment your weapon so for example if we see on my character sheet here my weapon whenever i deal damage with my weapon or a weapon skill i have a chance to cause this enchant to fire off and it will increase my weapon and spell damage by 348 for five seconds now weapon enchantments have a chance to a 20 percent base chance to apply single target direct attacks have a 10 percent base chance to apply area of effect weapon skills have a five percent chance to apply uh single target damage over times have three percent area of effects have one percent and then uh, light or heavy attacks of a 0% from destruction stabs have a 0% base chance, but these can be augmented by other factors in your passives. Now, there's also one other status effect that I want to, uh, give a shout out to, and that is also the bleeding status effect. It applies a bleeding dot to your opponent that cannot be mitigated by physical resistance, and it's basically just a damage over time that can be applied by certain weapon types and skills. Again, if you check out the passives of your weapon skill lines, it's usually axes that will be the ones applying bleeds, but other skills will also mention if they apply a bleed. Now, I also do want to mention that ultimates have their own way of scaling as well. Now, ultimates do scale with your highest resource and damage so for example even though my shooting star ultimate on this character deals flame damage if i was to use shooting star on a stamina damage dealer it would still get stronger in scale with my weapon damage and stamina because that is my highest resource and weapon damage pool so do keep that in mind that you can still use magicka morphs of ultimates on a stamina character and vice versa, but you will not gain certain passive benefits from those uh, damage types. So for example, if I was to use this shooting star ultimate and that deals flame damage on a stamina character, you don't really have any passives that augment flame damage or increase flame damage or, or improve it in any way because it's a magicka element. So even though the skill does get stronger, it won't receive any of those passive bonuses. So that is something to keep in mind. Uh, for the most part, you know, if something deals physical damage, it's good for stamina. And if it deals an elemental type damage, it's for magicka because the elements, like I said, are augmented by your uh, spell damage while physical type elements are all are augmented by your weapon damage. So you pretty much want to keep your ultimate types consistent with your build just for passive sake. Um, but I just wanted to make that note about the scaling process. And these also do cost ultimate. They don't cost magicka or stamina. They cost a separate resource called ultimate that you gain while you are being hit in combat or are hitting something else while in combat. And I'll go over the ways that ultimate are generated uh, more in the combat basics section. But do keep in mind that ultimates do not cost magicka or stamina. I also do want to mention that there is another resource or there is another um type of damage that i forgot to mention and i forgot to mention it because it is not on the stat sheet and i really do hope they add it and that is called penetration and penetration is the opposite of resistance so for example if you were to increase your spell penetration you will deal more damage uh you will you will lower the amount of resistance that your your spell resistance that your target has so if uh, spell penetration will counteract spell resistance just as physical penetration will counteract physical resistance so for example i have 93 48 physical resistance on this character and if somebody was attacking me with 8,000 physical penetration it would i would only effectively be defending myself with 1348 uh physical resistance so that is something to keep in mind uh when you are building out your characters and how it will affect your resistance
The next section that we are going to cover is weapon swapping. At level 15, you unlock the ability to have a second weapon bar. You're going to notice very quickly when you start playing that you can equip one weapon on your character, and that will also allow you to slot five skills as well as an ultimate. But when you hit level 15, if you go to your character sheet here, you will be able to see you can have a second set of weapons here. So I know a lot of people go, I don't know how to equip my second weapon. Simply open up your character sheet and you can drag a weapon into your back bar slot and you will unlock the ability to use a second weapon. So this not only allows you to equip a totally different weapon type and gain all of the passive bonuses that it has to offer, but you can also slot another five skills and a second weapon ultimate so this allows you to really kind of customize your your setups and really use a bunch of different weapons to take advantage of a lot of different skills as well as be able to slot more things to make your character be able to heal more efficiently deal more damage or do a better job tanking your enemies For this next section, we're going to be talking about skills, skill points, and sky shards. So you gain skill points in the Elder Scrolls Online in a number of ways, and skill points are what are used to unlock your ultimate, active, and passive abilities. So you can gain a skill point by simply leveling up from 1 to 50. You can collect three sky shards, which are item glowing shards that you can find around the world, and by collecting three of those, you will gain a skill point. You could also complete dungeon quests, defeat the final boss in a public dungeon, level up your PvP rank, etc. There's many, many, many ways to to gain skill points and skill points like i said are what you need to unlock ultimate active and passive abilities so your ultimate ability is what is slotted in that final skill slot on both of your bars so you can have two different ultimates at one time on your character and then you also have five different skills one for your primary bar and one for your secondary bar so in total <clears throat> you have 12 skills that are active that you have to physically press to make them do something at a time. Some skills do have passive slot benefits, uh, so by simply having the ability on your bar, you will gain some passive bonus, and those skills will tell you what they are. But for the most part, most active skills need to physically be pressed in order for you to do something. Some require a target, some just buff your character, but again, you have to actually click the skill. Passive abilities, on the other hand, are active on your character at all times. So, for example, at all times, the damage of my burning and poison status effects are increased by 50% at all times. As you can see, there are no restrictions on this passive. It doesn't say while I do this or while I do that. It's just something I have up on my character at all times. But there are certain passives that do have certain uh, requirements. For example, my one-handed shield passives will require me to obviously have a one-handed shield equipped in order to gain access to this passive. So Fortress says, with a one-handed shield equipped, reduce the stamina cost of my one-handed shield abilities by 10% and reduce the cost of blocking by 36%. So this is something to keep in mind when you are looking at your passives. In general, you're going to want to gain passives from your all of your class skill lines, any weapons you're currently using, your all of the armor types that you currently have on your character, your racial passives, medicinal use from alchemy, and then any other passives that, you know, your uh, that uh, correspond to skills that your character is using. So for example, if you're using some active skills from the mages guild, you're going to uh, skill line, you're going to want to have mages guild passives, etc. Now, sk active skills have their own leveling process. As you can see, a lot of my skills here are rank 4, molten whip 4, burning embers 4, and engulfing flames 4. Now, the way that skills work in the Elder Scrolls Online is that they have a base skill, and then once that skill levels up from 1 to 4, you can actually morph that skill into a different one. So you can actually give it some more power or even change the way the skill is. So, for example, my Searing Strike here, I'll actually bring up a picture, has a base version, again, Searing Strike, and it can be morphed into either Burning Embers or Venomous Claw. The Burning Embers morph will deal flame damage and deal flame damage over time and then heal me for 80% of the damage or whatever percent when the effect ends, while the Venomous Claw Morph will deal poison damage, deal poison damage over time, get stronger as it ticks, and cost stamina. Now, for my Magic Dragon Knight, I went with Burning Embers, since again, as I stated in an earlier section, because it costs Magicka, it will get stronger based off of my Magicka pool and my spell damage. But on my Stamina-based Dragon Knight, which has a larger Stamina pool and Weapon Damage pool, I would go with the Venomous Claw Morph, since that's going to be the stronger of the two morphs for my character. Now, not every skill has a Stamina or Magicka Morph. Many do, but not all. And primarily, you're going to see your Stamina Morphs on your 
on your damaging skills, occasionally skills that restore resources. But for them, a lot of times your utility skills cost magic. But just because when you look through your your skill lines, you're going to see, oh man, all of these skills all cost magic. You know, a lot of them do have stamina morphs. So there, that is something to keep an eye out for while you are leveling up. And if you also want to see what skills are best for your class and role while leveling, you could also feel free to check out the leveling builds on my website, dotsgaming.com. And those will help you in your adventures. But every single time you want to get an ultimate skill, an active skill, or a passive skill, you have to spend a skill point in order to get those. Uh, passive skills will get stronger with each rank, so this is two out of two. So at rank one, I would probably get 5%, and at rank two, you get 10%. And every single time you invest in the base cost of a skill and then morph it, that's one skill point each time. So one skill point for the base cost and then one skill point for the morph. Um, and another question I do get all the time is, is it possible to get, you know, all the skill points I need for a complete build and maybe to do some crafting later on? Because you have to spend points into your crafting passives in order to actually be able to craft. And yes, you can have enough skill points to do all of that stuff. There's a ton of sky shards in the world and a ton of skill points to collect. So do not worry that you will run out of skill points. There are a ton to collect for your character. Now, skills level up when they gain experience while on your active bar so for example as you can see currently my first skill bar my destruction staff is my active bar so molten whip burning embers engulfing flames rearming trap etc those skills will gain experience as i gain experience while this bar is up so they will level up but if i want to gain experience of the skills on my opposite bar i need to make sure that this is the active bar of my character while gaining experience for these skills in order to level up for example now that i'm on my secondary bar the skills of my primary bar won't be gaining experience while i gain experience on this bar so placing skills properly on your bars while leveling is really really important for your leveling process especially because you also need to level up your skill lines in addition to leveling up the skills and the skill lines will level up in a lot of different ways some skills need to level up from 1 to 50 some are 1 to 10 and if you hover your mouse over a skill line it'll tell you how that skill line gains experience so for example my ardent flame skill line will simply level up by gaining experience but if i equip additional ardent flame skills this skill's advancement will increase even faster. And all of your class skill lines have that same type of deal. They all level up in that way. So what I always recommend to a new player is you want to make sure you have at least one skill from all of your class skill lines on your front and back bar in order to make sure that your skill lines are leveling up at a good rate. Weapons and armor, on the other hand, are a little bit different. Weapons and armor will gain experience by you just simply wearing and using them, but weapon skill lines will also level up even quicker if you have a weapon skill slotted so you can see up here improve the skill by using a gaining xp with a two-handed weapon equipped but you can also equip two-handed abilities to increase the skills advancement and make it even faster so let's say i wanted to level up my two-handed really really fast i would use a two-handed weapon maybe you know slot like i said two two-handed skill lines and my two-handed would level up at a pretty quick rate but let's say i want to level up my destruction staff and maybe my one-handed shield at the same time what you could potentially do is use your destruction staff as your weapon but slot the first skill from the one-handed shield skill line on that bar so as you can see equipping one-handed skills will increase the skills advancement so even though i'm not using a one-handed shield you can still level up your one-handed shield skill line by simply having this skill slotted so that's just a little trick uh for leveling some skills up but generally what i recommend people do is like i said have one skill from all of your class skill lines on your front and back bar so make sure you have three of each and then you can fill out the rest of your your skill bars with either your weapon skills uh maybe you can put an armor skill there if you want to uh, various guild skills the, the rest of the of the skills are up to you but like i said you can feel free to check out my leveling builds for some recommendations but definitely make sure that you have those class skills slotted so you can level up your class skill lines as quickly as possible now, I did mention that skills are morphed once the base rank hits four, and then you can morph it into another skill. Once you morph the skill, though, that new skill will then be at rank one. You still do want to rank up the skill to rank four, even though you don't get another morph. And the reason is, is because as you level up the morphed skills, they will gain additional benefits. Sometimes the skill will cost less. Sometimes it'll deal more damage. Sometimes it'll heal you a little bit more. Sometimes certain durations will last longer. So do keep in mind that even once you morph a skill, it is still important to level it up to rank four by gaining experience, as I've stated in this section, to make sure that you're gaining the most benefit from all of your active skills.
the next section that I'm going to cover is gear, weapons, and traits. Now, unlike other MMOs, you have complete and open access to whatever weapon and armor type you want to use. There are no class restrictions or any type of restrictions for what armor and weapons you want to use. But with that being said, obviously certain weapons and certain armor types favor a certain play style over another, and that's what I'm here to show you today. So, for example, for our weapon skill lines, we have six different overarching types. We have two-handed weapons, you know, your mauls, your battle axes, and your great swords. One-handed shield, exactly what it sounds like. Dual wield, which is you holding two one-handed weapons, with your choices being swords, axes, mauls, or daggers. You also have your bow skill line, your destruction staff skill line, which is your elemental staffs, mainly fire, frost, and shock. And then finally, you have your restoration staff, which is also known as your healing staff. Now, you're going to notice very quickly that certain weapons favor a certain type of playstyle. So, for example, a two-handed weapon, you know, slam an enemy with an upward swing, dealing physical damage, and this costs stamina. And you're going to notice very quickly that all the skills in the skill line cost stamina. So, more likely than not, a two-handed weapon is going to want to be used for a stamina damage dealer. And on the flip side of the coin, you know, you have something like Force Pulse, which is deals flame frost and shock damage cost magica and you're going to notice very quickly all the skills in this tree cost magica so you'll most likely guess that this is going to be used as someone who uses magica as their primary resource and wants to deal damage with magical attacks now if you want to play a physical damage dealer your most common weapon choices are going to be your two-handed skill line dual wield and bow with one handed shield also being an option for pvp if you're a magical damage dealer you'll want to use two destruction stabs with flame being the most uh the most beneficial element of choice for your damage dealers lightning is an okay option but at the moment of recording this flame is the element of choice and with this tree in particular frost is actually a tanking element i'll actually go into tanking right now for tanking your weapons actually want to be one-handed shield and a destruction staff which i know to many people seems very weird but in elder scrolls online Destruction stabs have a uh, frost destruction stabs have tanking properties. So you can see equipping a frost staff reduces the cost of blocking by 36% and increases the amount of damage you can block by 20%. So if you combine the ancient knowledge passive by equipping a frost staff, you can use a skill like elemental blockade to reduce the movement speed and immobilize enemies that you're attacking, which is very, very beneficial for tank builds. But I do want to recommend that if you do choose to use a uh, one hit the shield and a destruction staff uh, that for the destruction staff when you're tanking do not take the tri focus passive which will when your frost staff is equipped blocking will cost magicka instead of stamina you want your block to always cost stamina so that is just kind of like a bit of a tip for the future but it's something to keep in mind but if you're tanking and you don't like destruction stabs, you can feel free to just stay double one-handed shield. And then for your healers, you're actually going to want to slot uh, destruction stabs and a restoration staff. Restoration staff being your primary bar, but destruction staff will actually support your playstyle a lot, primarily because of elemental drain, which will apply major breach to a target, which will reduce the spell resistance by 5280 and we learned earlier that that will you know cause your attacks to deal more damage if their resistances are lower and it also applies minor magic steel which will help members in your group maintain their magic pool so this is very important and also elemental blockade without getting too into it shock elemental blockade will set concussed enemies off balance and off balance is a very important um kind of like state for your enemies to be in because heavy attacks will restore more resources against them and certain types of dps will deal more damage against off balance targets and then for your magicka damage dealers your options are destruct double destruction staff i actually forgot to mention pvp you're going to want to use destruction staff and restoration staff for pvp or even destruction staff and one-handed shield and the reason that one-handed shield is a viable weapon type for magicka in pvp is a, for the similar reason that i mentioned earlier even though all of the skills from one-handed shield cost stamina the passives offer a ton of utility for magicka again using something of the opposite resources for the utility value that it provides so reduces the cost of blocking by 36 percent amount of damage you can block increase by 20 percent uh bashing costs 40 percent less stamina and deals extra damage 
increases the amount of, you can block from projectiles and range attacks and increases your movement speed while blocking by 60%. So, and all of this only requires a one-handed shield to be equipped. So in PvP, if you're a slow moving character that wants to be a bit tankier, you can use the one-handed shield for the passive benefits without needing to slot a single stamina skill and you will gain all these wonderful passive bonuses. So that's the cool thing about weapons is you have a bunch of choices and you can mix and match these, you know, based on the weapon types I stated to create a build of your, uh, your own choosing. Now, when it comes to armor, on the other hand, same thing. You can wear whatever armor type you want on your character, but it's going to be very apparent, again, that certain armor types favor certain skill, uh, certain playstyles. Light armor is going to be primarily used by magical damage dealers and healers. Medium armor is going to be primarily used for physical damage dealers, with heavy armor being used by tanks and tankier people in PvP. So you can, again, see magic recovery, uh, reduced magic cost, increases spell critical and spell penetration. For medium, we have increases weapon damage, uh, reduces stamina skill cost, increased healing received for heavy, uh, increases physical and spell resistance. So it's very apparent, you know, that this, the armor types have a certain leaning. But you can equip more than one armor type on your character. You can wear all three armor types at once. And you might be asking, well, how many types, well, how many pieces of each type should I wear? Generally, you want to have at least five pieces of your primary armor type on because of some of these passives. For example, the Prodigy passive requires you to be wearing five pieces of light armor in order to take advantage of it. So if you are a magical damage dealer, you're going to be able to wear five pieces of light. And since the seven total slots, you can actually wear one piece of medium and one piece of heavy. And you will take advantage of some of the medium armor passives that don't require five pieces of worn and same thing with the heavy ones. But in addition, you will also be able to take Take full advantage of the Undaunted Metal passive from the Undaunted skill line, which is a NPC guild that I'll be going over later in the video. That increases your max health, stamina, and magicka by 2% per armor type equipped. So if I wear at least one piece of heavy and one piece of medium while wearing my five pieces of light, I will gain 6% additional stats to my character, which is extremely powerful. So you know, if I'm a magical damage dealer, that's why you'll generally see them wearing five light, one medium, one heavy. If you're a physical damage dealer, you would want to be going five medium, one light, one heavy. And if you're a heavy armor wearing tank, you would want to go five heavy, one medium, and one light. Now, there are certain situations and for certain setups that you might want to wear all medium armor or six medium, one heavy, or five medium, two heavy, but... You can customize that based off of how you like, and maybe you want to take less advantage of Undaunted Metal and more advantage of some of the non-five-piece requiring passives. But the general setup for any person is five pieces of your primary armor type and one piece of each secondary armor types. So those are the reasons why you would want to use those. Now, moving into armor traits, all armor, weapon, and jewelry have traits on them that basically act as passive bonuses on that armor type. So, for example, my Burning Spell Weave robe here has the Divine trait on it, which will increase the effect of my Mundus Stones by 6.5%. My jewelry here has an Arcane trait on it, which will increase my maximum Magicka, while this front bar staff I have is Infuse, which will make my weapon enchantment stronger and lower the cooldown by a fair bit and all of these different gear types can be crafted or are dropped with a certain trait on it some gear pieces don't have traits but many do and i will now go over all of the traits that are available so for your armor traits you have divines which increases your munda stone effects invigorating which increases your magic of stamina and health recovery you have impenetrable which increases uh, critical resistance and reduces durability damage. You have Infuse, which increases the armor enchantment. So as you saw earlier, this Burning Spell Weave robe is enchanted with a Magicka enchantment. So the Infuse trait would increase the value of that enchantment. Nernhoned increases the spell and physical resistance. Reinforced increases the actual armor value of a item. Sturdy reduces the block cost. Training increases experience gained from kills, while well-fitted reduces the cost of sprinting and roll dodge. For your weapon traits, you have charged which will increase your chance to apply status effects we went over those a bit earlier in the guide we have defending which increases total physical and spell resistance infuse which i went just went over but it reduces the cooldown of an enchantment and increases the enchantment's uh, potency we also have nern honed which increases the amount of damage that a weapon deals uh, powered, which increases your healing done. Precise, which increases critical values. Sharpened, which increases penetration. Training, which increases the experience gained from kills. And finally, decisive, which gives you a chance to generate an additional ultimate anytime that you gain ultimate. And then finally, assuming that you have the Somerset 
chapter on your account, you can actually get some alternative jewelry traits besides Arcane, Robust, and Healthy, which are only available with the base game. For our jewelry traits, we have Arcane, which increases your maximum magicka. Bloodthirsty, which increases your damage dealt against enemies under 25% health. Harmony, which increases your damage, healing, resource return, and damage shield strength of synergies. Synergies will be gone over later in the video. We have Healthy, which increases your maximum health. Infused, which increases the jewelry enchantment. Protective, which increases your spell and physical resistance. Robust, which increases your maximum stamina. Swift, increases your movement speed. And Triune, increases your health, magicka, and stamina. So these are all traits that you can get on your character, uh, your character's gear. And traits can be changed with transmute stones. It's not like once you have uh, a trait on your gear, that's it. You can transmute a piece to change a trait, but I will, again, go over transmutation uh, later on in the guide. But one more thing that I want to cover before I end this section is armor values and where they are the most valuable. So you gain the most bang for your buck for a piece of armor on your chest piece. Your chest is going to offer the most armor value out of a piece of armor. So your chest will give you the highest armor value, followed by, followed by your head, shoulders, legs, and boots. Those are all the same. Those are all tied for the second most amount of armor you gain from a piece. As you can see, I get 1179 for both my legs and my boots. Uh, the third is would be gloves and then the smallest value would be a belt so when you are doing that 511 setup that i mentioned earlier obviously you're going to get the most benefit if your chest is the heavy piece and either your head shoulders legs or the boots are the medium piece now don't get me wrong sometimes certain gear sets only come in light armor and so in that case you might want to make your helmet heavy but your shoulders medium but generally if you do have to choose a piece to be heavy armor, you're not going to want to make it your belt since you won't gain that much benefit from that armor type. So that is something to keep in mind, though, when you are uh, equipping armor to your character. But that is a quick overview on weapons, armor, and the traits that you can have on all of your gear in The Elder Scrolls Online. The next section that I'm going to cover is Mundus Stones. Now, Mundus Stones are basically these big rock things that you can interact with in the world, and they give your character a passive benefit. They're really similar to Standing Stones in Skyrim. So, for example, this guy currently has the Apprentice Mundus Stone on, his, on my guy, so I'm currently gaining 299 increased spell damage because I went and interacted with the Apprentice Mundus Stone. And there, these can be scattered all around the world in different zones, or you can have them actually in your player house. There are There is player housing in the Elder Scrolls Online. I will go over it a bit later, but you can actually get the Mundus Stones for your house so that you can simply come back to your house and use the Mundus Stones instead of going around the world and uh, going to their specific locations. But I will go over what all the Mundus Stones are right now, and I'll also go over in what situations you might want to use certain Mundus Stones. So the first one we have is the Lady, which increases your physical and spell resistance. We also have the Lover, which increases your physical and spell penetration. We have the Lord, which increases your maximum health. The Mage increases your maximum magicka. The Tower increases your maximum stamina. The Atronach increases your magicka recovery. The Serpent increases your stamina recovery. The Shadow increases your critical strike damage. The Ritual increases your healing effectiveness. The Thief increases your critical strike chance. And the Warrior increases your weapon damage. The Apprentice increases your spell damage. And finally, the Steed increases your run speed as well as your health recovery. Now, in general, for PvE damage dealing as a Magicka character, your best options are going to be the Shadow, the Thief, or... The Apprentice. Those are going to be your three best Mundus Stone choices. Now, these may change based off of balances that come in the later patches, but at the time of making this video, the Shadow, the Thief, and the Apprentice are the three best. For a physical damage dealer, it is the Shadow, the Thief, and the Warrior. For a tank, you're looking at using the... Uh, the Atronach for more Magicka recovery because a lot of utility skills as a tank require Magicka and being able to recover more Magicka is extremely important. And we also have the Lord, which increases your uh, maximum health. That's also really good for a tank. And then finally, for a healer, we have uh, 
the Atronach again to increase your magic recovery and increase the rate at which your magic recovers, as well as the Ritual, which increases your healing effectiveness. So either of those are really good options. And then, of course, for PvP, uh, you have a lot of other choices. You know, for example, the Mage and the Atronach are good for Magicka PvP. The Serpent and the Tower are good for Stamina PvP. In addition to the ones from, uh, in addition to the Warrior for Magicka or for Stamina DPS and the Apprentice for Magicka DPS. But in terms of PvP Mundus, a lot of it does come down to preference and what you enjoy. But those are the the what the Mundus stones do, as well as a general overview of when you're going to want to use certain ones in certain situations. In this next section, I'm going to cover NPC guilds in the Elder Scrolls Online. There are six different NPC guilds that you can join, very similarly to the other Elder Scrolls games. We have the Dark Brotherhood, the Thieves Guild, the Fighters Guild, the Mages Guild, the Psijic Order, and the Undaunted. The Fighters Guild, Mages Guild, and Undaunted are included in the base game and are way more tied to your character's power, while the Dark Brotherhood, Thieves Guild, and Psijic Order are acquired from DLC, or in the case of the Psijic Order, the Somerset chapter in order to join those guilds. Now, if you, assuming you have the Dark Brotherhood DLC, the Thieves Guild DLC, and the Sigic or and the uh, Somerset chapter, the way that you start uh, and join these various guilds is you need to go to the Stories tab and go to Zone DLC. And then if you do Dark Brotherhood and click Accept Quest, as well as Thieves Guild Accept Quest, you will get the quest lines to start off on your adventures to join these two guilds. For the Somerset chapter, you need to simply start, again, the Queen's Decree. It's the uh, starting quest for uh, Somerset. And throughout starting the uh, opening main quest of Somerset, you will eventually be introduced to the Psijic Order, and you will be able to acquire that skill line. And the Psijic Order is a very good skill line, and if you have Somerset, it is definitely worth investing the time into getting. But... The Undaunted is crucial to every single character. The Mages Guild is important for all Magicka-based characters, and the Fighters Guild is important for Stamina-based characters. So I'm going to focus mostly on those three as they're more um, they're more crucial for your uh, for your character's power. So the Mages Guild, the Fighters Guild, the Undaunted are joined by going to the starting city of your faction. So if you're on the Ebonheart Pact, you'll be going to the uh, to Davin's Watch in Stonefalls. If you are on the Almer Dominion, you'll be going to Volkel Guard in Auradon. And if you are on the Daggerfall Covenant, you'll be going to Daggerfall in Glenumbra. And you're going to be looking for this icon to join the Mages Guild, this icon to join the Fighters Guild, and you, the, one of the inns in order to join the Undaunted. So if you want to join the Mages Guild, you simply go into the Mages Guild in your faction starting city. And when you come into here, you will be able to talk to one of these NPCs. They will have a quest for you, and you will be able to talk to them and join the Mages Guild. It simply is going, hey, I'd like to join the Mages Guild. Bing, bang, boom, you're in, and you gain access to the skill line. And you level up the Mages Guild skill line by collecting more books around the world. So you could also do the Mages Guild quest. The Mages Guild does have its own quest line, but it levels up by collecting those lore books. It just gets very similar to Sky Shards, where you can find them scattered around the world, and you can acquire them and level up your Mages Guild. Now, if you want to join the Fighters Guild, you simply come here, talk to this guy, be like, hey, I want to join the Fighters Guild, and they go, all right, sounds good, and then you join the Fighters Guild. And you level up the Fighters Guild by killing Undead, by killing Daedra, as well as con uh, closing Dark Anchors, aka Dolmens, which I'll be going over in a later section of the guide. Now, finally, the Undaunted. The Undaunted is basically the guild focused around dungeons and dungeon diving, and you're going to want to come to one of the inns in your starting town and you will see these guys all sitting around a table drinking some mead talking about their dungeoneering adventures and if you talk to them you'll get a quest to go simply do a dungeon come back talk to them and you'll be able to get your undaunted skill line and to level up the undaunted skill line you want to do dungeon achievements pledges which i will be going over later in the guide um, and you could also potentially do some delve quests that you can get from the Undaunted Enclave, which can be found in the Faction Capitals, but again, I'll be going over that in the Pledges section. But this, again, is focused around primarily doing um, dungeon quests uh, and dungeon achievements. And when you join all of these NPC guilds, you get a corresponding skill line that goes with it, like I mentioned, and I mentioned how you level these up. But some of these skill lines are 
you know, they give active abilities in an ultimate, like the Fighters and Mages Guild. Um, Undaunted only gives actives, no ultimate. This gives only two passives, while the Mages Guild and the Fighters Guild have some more passives. And then you have the Dark Brotherhood and Thieves Guild, which are passives only. And then the Sigic Order is really similar to Fighters and Mages, where you have four actives as well as an ultimate so you're able to get a wide variety of benefits from these guild skill lines again some are more integral to your character's power and some like the dark brotherhood and thieves guilds are just kind of some more rp elements but using these guild skill lines you're really able to customize your character a little bit more and make them that much more your own The next thing that I'm going to talk about is player guilds, guild stores, and traders. So in the Elder Scrolls Online, you can join up to five different player guilds at once. For those of you who have never played an MMO before, a player guild is simply, it's like a clan. You know, it's a group of people that can join one group and you get your own chat room and you guys can go out and do various types of activities together. But the cool thing about ESO is you can be in up to, like I said, five guilds at once. And of course, there are different types of guilds in this game, uh, just like there are in other games. There are guilds that focus on PvP content. There are guilds that focus on running trials, which is this game's version of the raid there are guilds that are just social guilds there uh, that you know just focus on the social elements of the game guilds that are focused on role playing and most notably for eso that's way different than any other mmos there are guilds that are focused on trading so for example the main trading guild i'm in spicy economics uh they have a guild trader in mournhold which is a one of the capital cities and they have a guild trader there. Now, you might be saying, I don't know what that means. I don't know what a guild trader is or what a trading guild is. There is no central auction house inside of the Elder Scrolls Online. ESO goes off of a guild trader system. So the way it works is that all guilds have a guild store. So if you go to, your, uh, to any bank, you can find a bank by this chest icon in any of the cities. If you go to a bank and talk to the banker, you can click guild store. And you can sell items on that guild store or buy items off of that guild store. Now, assuming you don't have a guild trader, a guild store is simply just a place where you can buy and sell items between the various members of your guild. But if you have a guild trader, the guild trader is an NPC in the world that makes that guild store public facing. So while somebody who, let's say, who's not in spicy economics, they can purchase from our guild trader, but they can't sell on the guild trader. Only people in the guild can sell on the trader, but when you have an NPC that's public facing, anyone can buy from the trader. But as like assuming that the guild didn't have a trader that wasn't public facing, you would only be able to, per you, only guild members would be able to purchase from that guild store. And the way that guild traders work is that if let's say, you know, you are a guild master and you want to build on a guild trader, you can simply go to a guild trader here and you can click bid on trader and you're able to place a bid on the trader for your guild and have a potentially, you know, have that guild, uh, that NPC be represent your guild and your guild store. And it's every week it evaluates who placed the highest bid and whoever placed the highest bid takes control of this guild trader. And if you're a new player who is looking for a guild to join, I have a social guild called Dippin' Dots. We do a lot of variety of things, PvP, PvE, Socialize, etc. Across all platforms and regions with the exception of PS4 EU. So if you are interested in joining our guild ranks, please refer to the Discord link in the description below. And join our Discord and ask for an invite there. The next thing that I'm going to cover is mount training, bag space, and banking. So as a new player, these three things are the primary things you should be spending your gold on. I uh, see a lot of a lot of new players make the same mistake where they buy all you know a ton of stuff that they don't need, but these three things are the primary stuff that you need to be worrying about spending your money on and leveling up while you are uh, going through your starting adventure. So starting off with mount training, when you hit level 10, you're going to get a mount from the level up rewards because every time you level up, you get some rewards. And one of those rewards at level 10 is a mount. And you're going to notice very quickly that when you get that mount, it's very, very slow. So you want to make sure that every day you go to a stable, which is shown uh, as a horse head on the map, and you go and you talk to the stable master. You click view stable, and 
You can you could buy a mount if you would like to, but you get one for free from the level 10 reward, so you could just use that, or you could buy one off the crown store. And once you have a mount equipped, which you can do by going into the collectibles, going to mounts, and setting one as an active mount, you will be able to see this window for riding trainer, and you have three riding skills, speed, stamina, and carrying capacity. So speed increases the uh, movement speed of your mount, stamina in, uh, increases your mount, lets your mount sprint longer, and you can take more hits before you become dismounted and carrying capacity increases your bag space so what i recommend to do in a person for an order is to level up speed to maximum first trust me you want to do speed first or your mount is slow as all heck when you go if you're going to be pvping you're going to want to do stamina second so that if you get hit while you're mounted going from one place to another you won't immediately get dismounted and someone won't have the jump on you but if you're a PvE player primarily and you're not going to be getting hit by stuff constantly while you're going around on your map, carrying capacity might be a little bit more beneficial to you to increase that bag space for you. But ultimately, I would just say do speed first and then do stamina or carrying capacity in whatever order you want. Now, it's 250 gold every 20 hours. Definitely make sure to do this every day. Uh, it really, really, really helps getting this leveled up. Now, besides this, I also did mention leveling up your bag space. As you can see, this guy only has 120 bag spaces. I do want, really need to level this up a bit more. Um, and that will get leveled up as I also get more carrying capacity on my mount, you know, because that influences your bag space. But if you go to a pack merchant, which there's one all the way tucked back here. If you go to a pack merchant, you can talk to this guy and buy a backpack upgrade. So you can increase your inventory size by 10 more slots by talking to this guy and buying a backpack upgrade. So it can be seen if you hover over like, for example, the, uh, the uh, weights here on the map, you can see it says pack merchant. And you can go talk to the pack merchant and you can upgrade your bag. And then finally, the last thing that you have is the bank. So if I go over here to the bank, all right, so we travel over here. The bank is a shared storage space across all of your characters. It's not like characters have an individual bank. There's a, any one of your characters can access this, this bank that you have. So you can simply go to the bank and you can, so you just talk to the banker, bank, and you can deposit and withdraw items from your bank as you need. If your bank space is not at maximum uh, size, you will also see a thing at the bottom that allows you to upgrade your bank size to be larger. Now, bank space is not the only way to store items. You can also store items in storage inside of your player house. And that is, again, you can go to that storage on any one of your characters and access the items that you store in the trunk. I just kind of want to cover this uh, now with the banking section just simply because it has to deal with item storage now you can get these chests in a multitude of ways you can get them from the crown store you can buy them with telvar which is a currency from doing the imperial city dlc you could also get them from doing writ vouchers which is something that you acquire from doing uh like quest like a uh, crafting daily quests i'll be going over again those later in the video but there's a multitude of ways to get these chests and you can basically place them in any one of your player houses and you will have access to them for storage like i said across all of your characters and i thought i was doing a really good job at filling the load screen time here with chatter just trying to travel to my house talking about a variety of things but i'm going to probably cut it right here and fast forward to when i'm actually at my chest but now as you can see i'm inside my house and i have these varied storage coffers so we have three right here and one big boy over there so if i go into the storage coffer you can see there's a ton of different items in here tons of items in here stuff in there i have nothing in this one yet and then again, I have a banker inside of my guild house. So this is just another way that you can get some alternative storage that's shared across all of your characters besides just going to the bank. The next thing that I'm going to cover is key binding. So simply by pressing escape and clicking controls, you are, you are able to select whatever key binds you want for various actions inside of the game up to four different types of binds now i do recommend if you are on pc getting the votons key binder add-on because for whatever reason eso does not have an account wide key binding selection so if you set up your key binds for one guy and make a second character you will have to do it all over again so if you simply use an add-on like votons key binder you'll be able to 
keybind all of this stuff and share it across all of your characters. Now, do not forget, a lot of add-ons do require keybinds to actually be able to appear. For example, the combat metrics, which is the DPS counter that I use. The fight report will not appear unless you toggle a key that will actually make it appear. Same thing with dressing room, which is that add-on I use to switch my gear sets. It won't actually appear unless I bind a key to it. So if you have an add-on and you're like, I can't find it, I don't know where it is, be sure to check the add-on keybinds to make sure that you need that you have a key bound to that specific add-on to make it actually appear. The next thing that I'm going to cover is the outfit station, because we all know, we all know that fashion is endgame. So the outfit station is where you're able to customize the appearance of your character, how your character looks, and what their outfit looks like. So you can find it in any major city for the most part, and I'll go show you uh, what the icon looks like. Uh, you can find it right here. You can see at the bottom of the Daggerfall Millworks says Outfit Station. And when you go to that Outfit Station, you are able to use it. And you have to select your outfit to Outfit 1. And then you can assign any number of what are called motifs to your gear to make them look a certain way. And motifs are acquired through a variety of ways in the Elder Scrolls Online. And they're tied very closely to your crafting profession. So I will be going over motifs a little bit more in that section. But basically motifs are just things that you collect to make your gear look a certain way. So when you come to the outfit station, any known motifs across your entire account are now accessible at the outfit station. So you can make your helmets, shoulders, weapons, whatever you want look a certain way and the cool part is you're not tied to let's say a certain weight so for example right now this guy's wearing heavy armor i can make it look like i'm wearing light armor if i want to um i can make my two-handed axe look like a two-handed sword i can make my uh one-handed mace look like a dagger like you can you can customize it in that way no you cannot make your staff look like a sword it needs to be of the same skill line so for example i can't make my one-handed weapons look like big two-handed weapons it has needs to be across the same skill line you could also dye your weapon to make it look a different color if you would like i highly recommend whenever you do the dye sort by hue and not by rarity it makes your life infinitely easier so you're able to dye your armor to make it look a certain way now like i did mention earlier there is costume dyeing so this is what my character's outfit looks like but if i wanted to i could wear a costume instead that would overwrite my character's outfit so if i wanted to wear the nord hero armor i could Put on the Nordic Hero armor, and as you can see, it overrides my current outfit. And now, if I wanted to change the colors of this as an ESO Plus member, I could go to costume and hat dyeing, and I could dye my outfit whatever color, or my uh, my costume whatever color I would like. Now, do keep in mind that every single time that you change your outfit and make a change, it either costs gold or outfit change tokens, which can be purchased on the Crown Store. And just so that I can let people know what outfit I am wearing, because I know I'm going to get asked about it in the comments section of the video. I am using the Fire Drake helmet, Yoked and Pauldron, Celestial Gauntlets and Boots, Skin Changer Legs, Chest, and Waist, Elambrus Battle Axe, Elambrus Sword, and Skin Changer Shield with the Vex Mystic Blue, Cold Harbor Ash Black, and Soul Shriven Gray dyes. The next thing that I'm going to cover is way shrines and fast travel. So way shrines are basically the things that you use for fast travel in ESO. Once you walk to a way shrine and discover it, you can fast travel to that way shrine at any time. So let's say you are not at a way shrine and you want to travel to one. You can just simply find one on your map, click it, and for a gold cost, you will fast travel to that way shrine. Do keep in mind that successive way shrine travels will cost more gold if you do not use another way shrine to travel there. So I'll be able to show you once I've actually successfully traveled to this one what I mean by that. But if you use a way shrine to travel from one to another, it is free. And then obviously, as you saw, I wasn't at a way shrine, so it had a gold cost. But let's say now I go up. So you, as you can see, if I go up to this way shrine, I can select another one for no fee. But assuming I teleport the exact same way I just did and I want to teleport to another way shrine, as you can see, it will cost 1,100 gold that goes down over time. So after a certain period of time, I'll be able to teleport again for that 146 gold. And the gold cost of your way shrine travels does scale with your level. So don't worry, it's not going to be as expensive when you are level three and don't have any money. So the higher level you get, the more that those way shrine uh, travels will cost. But 
Way shrines are not the only way to fast travel. There's a couple cheeky ways that you can fast travel. So for example, if you are in a guild, you can look at any one of your guild members, right? So let's say I want to travel to Deshaun. I can right click this member in my guild and click travel to player. And of course, as soon as I did that, he went somewhere else. So if I click travel to this guy, I will be able to travel to this guy for free. But it will also raise the cost of my next fast travel not using a way shrine. So just because you fast travel in this way does not mean you could use this to circumvent the gold cost. No, you don't spend any gold fast traveling in this way. But if you try to fast travel, like I said, to a different way shrine, you know, not teleporting to a player, you know, to a different way shrine and not using a way shrine, it will cost that extra gold cost as if you did fast travel with the gold cost. I hope you kind of see where I'm going with that explanation. I know it can sound a little confusing, but hopefully that makes sense. But besides just teleporting to other guild members, you can teleport to group members in the exact same way. So if you were, if I was in a group of somebody, I'd be able to right click, hit travel to player and would be able to go to them. So I definitely do recommend making sure you're in a guild for, for easy fast travels. It's really, really nice to be able to right click someone fast travel it'll put you near the uh, nearest way shrine and then you can travel to wherever you want for free so it's a nice way to basically fast travel around the map without spending really any gold so it's a really nice way to do it but that is all the different ways that you could fast travel you could actually one more way before i head off for this section you could also travel to your houses you can fast travel to houses so for example i have the rosy lion which is located in Daggerfall. It's like a little apartment. So if I ever wanted to uh, teleport to Daggerfall, instead of teleporting to the Daggerfall Way Shrine, uh, you know, maybe for a gold cost, I could just travel to the Rosy Lion Inn and that'll put me right in the heart of Daggerfall. So those are all the different ways that you could fast travel in the Elder Scrolls Online. This section is going to cover maximum level, the champion point system, as well as scaling. So there is a maximum level in ESO of level 50, but level 50 and reaching level 50 is only the start of your adventures because once you hit level 50, you dump, you jump to champion point level 10, or in terms of in-game jargon, CP10. And CP is basically, aka champion points, is your end game progression and how your character levels up past the maximum level of 50. 50 really isn't the max level, it's just like a break point to get into the end game progression. Now you basically, when you enter the CP system, you unlock the champion point trees. And there's three types of trees here. We have the green trees, which primarily deal with resource sustain. The blue trees, which primarily deal with damage. And the red trees, which primarily deal with damage mitigation. And when you unlock these trees, like I said, you get 10 CP points. So you're able to place these points throughout these various trees and you get the points for the various types so for example you're not going to just get prime all blue points or all green points you're going to get points for all three different types of trees and that's when you can spend them now the maximum number of usable champion points in the game is 810 but you can earn past that you just can't use the points now i know you might be thinking that 810 sounds like a crazy high amount there's no way you'll ever catch up but when you first hit champion point level 10 you gain 4.8 i believe it's 4.8 million xp of enlightenment now enlightenment is a mechanic where it increases the speed at which you gain experience think of it as kind of like rested experience if you played world of warcraft so you gain uh, for a certain number of experience you gain it way quicker than normal experience so you're able to get through your first like couple hundred champion points fairly quickly and you also gain some refreshment on that enlightenment every day with that four point i believe it's 4.8 or 4.6 million being your capped out value of enlightenment so once it eventually banks up to that you no longer are able to gain additional enlightenment until you consume some of it now there are a couple of really really important break points for champion points and that's champion point 160 as well as champion point 300 so champion point 160 is when gear stops getting better so as you can see i'm champion point 1001 but my gear here is champion point 160. Once you reach that level, that is when gear stops increasing in level, which is good for the game because every time they release an expansion or every time they release a DLC, you don't have to go and farm out all new gear. Your gear is still going to be as valuable today as it will be tomorrow, which is a really, really good thing about the system. So even if you take an extended break, you can come back and all of your gear will still be leveled up for you. So that is an incredibly important breakpoint. Dude, you know, you have your 
your your gear cap at CP160, and I wouldn't really even worry about gear and gear sets prior to that. You know, once you get to CP160, that's when you can get a bit particular about what types of gear and gear sets you wear. And then another important breakpoint is CP300, which is where you stop gaining stats from your CP. Because now every time you level once you're CP10, you're no longer going to get a skill point like 1 to 50, you're going to get a champion point. And for the first 300 champion points, every single time you spend a CP point, you gain a stat. So if you spend points in the blue trees, you're going to gain some additional magic on your character. Red trees will gain, give you some additional health, and green trees will give you some additional stamina. So all, you know, the first 300 points will give you resources based on the color, but then once you hit CP 300, you will have maximum resource values for your character, for your levels, and then pass from 300 to 810, you're basically looking at, uh, you're basically looking at just the, the champion points gaining uh, will, will be your progression, basically. Now, there are an important thing with the champion points called jump points. I do, do want to mention these because I want to make sure that you, as new players, understand this. Basically, a jump point is is uh, when you actually gain a increase in value from your CP. So, for example, you can see I have uh, 56 points in Elfborn, which gives me a 20.15% chance increase to my critical damage and critical healing on my Magicka skills. Jump points, like I said, it's a whole value, so where you actually gain additional value. So right now, if I, ha I have 56 points in here, right, 20.15%, it actually is 20%. If I place another point, 20.36%, nope, still only 20% increase. 20.5%, 20.57%, still only 20% increase. 20.78%, no, still only 20% increase. It all rounds down. 20.98, nope, still only 20. Boom, 61, we moved up to 21.18%. What does that mean? 61 is a jump point. So we actually were able to put enough points in to get enough value. Now you're going to notice that at the lower uh, values of CP for a certain star, that you gain, you get jump points very, very quickly, and that as you get higher up, you gain them way slowly way more slowly and that is because the cp system is front loaded so there's way more value for your first um like five to six hundred champion points than your last 300 ish so once you get up to five or six hundred cp you're going to notice that you're going to hit jump points less and less frequently and that's when the diminishing returns really begin to kick in also these other stars up here, you gain these bonuses based off of how many points you have in a specific tree. So, for example, in The Apprentice, I have 186 points in The Apprentice, which means that, you know, I also have Arcane Well, which unlocked at 120 points into Apprentice. So, you don't have to put a point into here, but it is just a perk that you unlock as you place more points in these specific trees. Now, in addition, ESO has scaling in the game. There, it's not like WoW, theme park, MMO, you know, there's low level zones and high level zones. Everything is relevant the whole game. So even Fungal Grotto 1, that dungeon that you unlock at level 10, is still going to be relevant to you when you are maximum level. It's going to scale. It's going to scale up to the champion point levels as you level up. The whole world around you is basically scaled to CP160, which is why that um, that gear breakdown is so important. But just because your CP810 doesn't mean you're going to walk through everything. In Overlands, yes, Overlands stuff will be a bit easier to you just because of the mobs are, you know, CP160. But when you go into Trials and certain veteran dungeons, their stats are way scaled up, so it's going to be a much tougher challenge to basically accommodate a group, so that is something to keep in mind. But the good thing about the scaling tech in ESO is that you're able to quest and, and play in whatever zone you want. You know, So let's say you're a new player and you're level 12, and you're questing in East March, and you're like, I hate the East March quest line, it's boring to me. You can literally just stop what you're doing, go to the Rift, and try picking up a new quest line. You can go to whatever zone you want. And it's also nice because you can play with people who are different levels. So if you're level 25 and someone else is level 43 and you guys want to play together, you can absolutely do that because of the scaling inside of the game. Because a common complaint I get from people is like, Dots, I'm a low level and I'm gaining a level and my, my stats are going down. What's up with that? But that's the scaling stuff. As you level up, you have more skills, you have more passives, you have better gear, so you have better power. So your maximum stats are basically decreasing as you go up to make up for that. Or you could also look at it as, as a lower level, you're given more max stats because you don't have all of those passives, abilities, better gear, etc. So you need those other stats on your character to make up for missing 
those things. So don't be shocked as you level up if your stats are changing a little bit. It is just the scaling stuff, basically scaling you to the world around you. So just something to keep in mind when you go through your leveling adventures. The next section that I'm going to cover is Vampire versus Werewolf versus Mortal. Which one of these should you be and why? Or maybe you shouldn't even be either. Vampirism and Werewolf are both great in their own way, and they both have their own drawbacks. You can't obviously get all of the benefits from just making your character a certain thing without there being some sort of penalty. Now, if you choose to be a vampire, you're going to gain access to a new skill line as well as some new passives. And the main reason people choose to be a vampire is for a couple of different reasons. We have the one skill mist form, which I'm going to show on the screen here. Mist form is used most commonly by slower moving magicka characters inside the game because mist form basically allows them to gain a form of major expedition and movement speed, break out of their roots, as well as reduce damage taken by 75%. But of course, during that time, they're immune to crowd control effects and cannot be healed and their magic recovery is disabled. It's mainly used for movement and getting out of sticky situations. Now, that's mainly for PvP. From a PvE perspective, we are looking at the Supernatural Recovery passive, which basically increases your magic and stamina recovery by 10%. It's a reason that a lot of PvE damage dealers choose to use that. And then for tanking, we have the Undeath passive, reduces your damage dealt to you when you fall below 50% health, and this can increase up to 33%. So, you know, as you get lower and lower below 50%, you could take up to 33% less damage. So I personally recommend Vampirism to anyone who wants to gain some more magic recovery on their character in pve i also recommend it to anyone who's tanking you know who wants to gain that undeath passive it's also really really good so magic damage dealers healers and tanks uh, are going to take good advantage of vampirism it's not mandatory but if you feel that you could use that extra recovery then go right ahead now you might be asking well dots what about what about stamina dps why why don't stamina dps really need it Stamina DPS tend to be a bit more up in the fray. You know, obviously they're at the boss's feet attacking them, while Magicka DPS more traditionally are standing further away. Magicka DPS are also traditionally a little bit more tanky in PvE because they have damage shields, while um, Stamina DPS rely primarily on heals. They don't have damage shields. So the extra, the drawbacks of Vampirism is that your health recovery is lowered, you take greater damage from fire-based attacks, and you also take greater damage from fighters guilds skills, which that only applies to PvP really. But the main thing is that that flame, extra flame damage you take as a stamina character can, can make your life really difficult when you're up in the boss's face. And if some flame attack goes off and you get clipped by it, you're, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So, you know, vampirism is a good option though. If you do really feel you need that extra recovery, if you're struggling, you know, sustaining your, your resources, you know, your vampirism is a good option, but I, I don't always recommend it for, uh, for stamina. It's not, it's not a mandatory by any means. It's definitely a huge positive for magicka, for healers, and definitely for tanks. Um, but for stam, it's not, it's not always needed. Now you might be saying, well, that you just said everything in the game, why would you use a werewolf? But really quick, actually, before I address that, I want to say one more thing. For PvP with vampirism, the only way I'd ever use vampirism inside of PvP is if you absolutely need mist form. If you do not need mist form, I don't recommend vampirism because of the fact that vampirism causes you to take a lot of extra damage from flame, which is the primary element used in PvP, as well as fighter's guild skills. And the fighter's guild ultimate dawnbreaker is one of the most used skills by all stamina characters. So you will take a lot of extra damage for being a vampire. So it is something to keep in mind. Now, werewolf on the other hand, Werewolf is primarily taken if you actually want to be a werewolf. Werewolf, the only real drawback of being a werewolf is you do take a lot of extra poison damage, but that negative effect only happens when you're inside of werewolf form because werewolf actually causes you to transform into a werewolf. It's an ultimate ability that you slot. You gain a skill bar while you are transformed into a werewolf and are in that werewolf form. While vampirism is just something like you're a vampire. It's active on your character at all times. You can play your character as normal, but for the werewolf, you have to physically transform into it using an ultimate. And like I said, you also do unlock an additional skill bar, but you do also get some benefits from simply having the werewolf skill slotted. As you can see here, these are the different werewolf morphs of the ultimate, but the most notable 
notable thing is that while slotted, your stamina recovery is increased by 15%. So simply slotting this ultimate will give you a huge boost to your stamina recovery. So I would recommend being a werewolf if you obviously plan on playing as a werewolf character. You know, you're not going to have access to your normal skill lines while transformed. So do keep that in mind. So if you want to run around and play as a werewolf, you know, use the get those big bleeds up, get all that, that different uh, physical and spell resistance, then, then werewolf would be good for you. Big drawback with werewolf is that the AoE damage from it is a bit limited, uh, but it does have really good single target. Uh, werewolf is great for newer players as well. If you want a bit of an easier time DPSing simply because it's just literally mainly light attacking, uh, which is really good. And you can find some werewolf builds and whatnot out on, uh, you know, YouTube and the internet and whatnot. But I'd also recommend playing a werewolf if you maybe only really need one ultimate for your character. You know, maybe you don't need two ultimate slots. You know, you're, you're like, okay, my back bar ultimate, I don't really need anything here. You could also slot the werewolf transformation there just to help you gain that extra 15% stamina recovery. So that is an option. Now, how why would i want to be a mortal then you'd want to be immortal if the vampirism and werewolf stuff doesn't really sound appealing to you maybe you plan on pvping and you don't want to get absolutely clapped by dawnbreaker there you go be immortal maybe you're playing a stamina dps and you want both your ult slots and and you don't want to be squishy because of vampirism be immortal none of these things are mandatory on any one of your characters it's really up to personal preference and what you want to how you want to build your character and and give your character some more strengths and weaknesses now you might be saying, that sounds all great and all, but how do I actually become a vampire or werewolf? Now, you can buy them off the crown store, but I do not recommend buying it off the crown store at all. And the reason that I don't recommend it is because other players can actually turn you into a vampire or a werewolf. If you go to a werewolf or vampire shrine, there's different shrines for each, okay? And have another player who's already a werewolf or a vampire come with you they can basically bite your character and turn you into whichever one of those things you want to turn into as long as they have a certain passive perk so if you're in a guild or you're in zone chat you can simply ask somebody to help you know give you vampirism or give you werewolf do not pay for a bite Paying for bites used to be a thing back when ESO first started, but nowadays it is really bad practice to ask someone to pay you for a bite. So if someone is asking you for money, refuse and just get someone in a guild. There are plenty of people who will give it to you for free. Now, let's say you don't want to buy the crown store and you don't want to pay, you know, get a friend or anybody to give it to you. There's another way that you can do it and that there are certain ad spawn locations in the world where there are certain blood fiends or certain werewolves will spawn that can cause you to contract the diseases. So you can go to one of those different spawn locations. A simple Google search will show you where they are and you can contract uh, the disease of your choice. And then after that, you'll get a quest line where you have to go to one of the shrines to start a quest line, and then you will unlock the skill line. Now, let's say you are a vampire or a werewolf and you want to cure it. You can go to buy it from the crown store, but again, I don't recommend buying it from the crown store. There are mages guild town, certain mages guilds in certain towns, for example, like the Mages Guild and uh, Evermore, which can be found at Bang Korai. If you go to the Mages Guild there and talk to, he's like, he's all the way in the back of the first floor. If you go talk to the guy there, he can cure you of your vampirism or of your werewolf status for a small gold fee. It's not anything crazy. And boom, you now are back to being mortal. So that is just a quick overview on vampirism versus werewolf versus mortal. Benefits and con uh, pros and cons, why you might want to be one as well as how to acquire and cure it. The next thing that I'm going to cover is rededication shrines, AKA character respecking. One of the biggest questions I get is, Dots, I placed a skill point where I don't want it. Is my character ruined? Do I have to delete it and start over? No, you can respec and move your points around by coming to one of these shrines inside of any of your capital cities. So I'm talking Mournholds for the Ebonheart Pact. We are talking Elden Root for the Almeri Dominion, as well as uh, Wayrest for the Daggerfall Covenant. And when you go into, uh, you can see on the map here, there's this symbol, Rededication Shrine. You will see these three shrines, and these shrines will basically allow you to redo your points. So I'm in uh, Mournhold right now, and the, the specific shrine names are different based off your capital. But if I go to the Shrine to Stoon, 
I can make a donation, a generous donation, to redo my skills or just my skill morphs. Now, the way it used to be is if you wanted to redo your skills, it would basically wipe out all your skill points and you'd have to redo everything again. But now, if you want to redo your stuff, you hit, let's say, skills, and you can pick and choose which points you want to change, how you want to move things around, and then when you can confirm, you can just pay a modest gold fee and you will be able to redo your points. Now, do keep in mind, the more skill points you are redoing, the greater the cost, which is why, you know, if you want to redo your skill points at level 7, it's not going to be 11,000 gold for you. It's the more points you have and the more points you will actually be reassigning, the greater the gold cost. Now, if I also go to, I don't want to talk to you again, if I also want to go to here, the Shrine to Kine, I could redo my attribute points if I so desired. And then finally, the Shrine Tamara is basically used for um, marriage in the game. So let's say you guys have a scroll of uh, Mara and you and another character come to the Shrine of Mara. You two can get married and you'll also get Rings of Mara, which also give you a 10% XP boost. But that is the Rededication Shrine and how you redo your points. The next thing that I'm going to cover is dungeons in the Elder Scrolls Online. So dungeons are four player instances that have one tank, one healer, and two DPS. And you unlock these at level 10. And there's a ton of different dungeons in the game. There are two difficulties as well, normal difficulty and veteran difficulty. So you can think of this as kind of like a normal dungeon and a heroic from uh, World of Warcraft. So when you are a lower level, obviously you will only have access to some of these normal dungeons. And then as you begin to progress into your champion point levels, you will unlock some of these veteran dungeons to do as well. But like I said, they're just four player instances where you go and you, you know, it's like a dungeon from any other MMORPG where you go and you fight ad packs, you fight your bosses. Finally, you have your big final boss and boom, you get some rewards from it. Now, you can also do just, you know, like normal. You could do a random normal dungeon per day or a random veteran dungeon per day and get you a huge boost to your experience or and so a package of premium undaunted exploration supplies. So as you are leveling up throughout the game, I recommend doing at least your random normal dungeon every single day so that you can get that big boost to experience as well as that great batch of supplies to help your character not only level up, but get some really good loot along the way. And dungeons are also a really good way to acquire gear. So as you are leveling leveling up your crafting professions, which I'll go over a bit later in the video. You can get tons of gear that you can deconstruct from materials, and that also will cause you to gain a ton of experience. So it's a really, really, really good way to do some leveling. Also, dungeons are incredibly fun. Uh, the veteran dungeons, also the final bosses, all have a hard mode, so you can basically increase the final difficulty of the final boss which will give you an extra challenge if you and your team want to take it on. And especially the dungeons that come out in the DLCs a couple times a year, those ones tend to be the most challenging of all and will uh, will push you and your group mates to the limit in terms of uh, actually fighting stuff and working together. So, like I said, four-player dungeons, one tank, one healer, two DPS is the traditional, uh, the traditional makeup of a group. And it's, you know your normal dungeon from any other game. You can also queue up for the dungeons themselves, so you can queue up for individual specific dungeons if you would like, or like I said, just toss yourself into the random queue. But you could also travel to the dungeons manually if you so desire. You can see them on your map. For example, there's Darkshade Caverns 1 and 2 here. So if I wanted to, I could travel to this dungeon with my group without going through the queue system. Now, something else to note. I got this asked a lot in my streams and I actually wanted to amend this to this section before I move on. There is no like maximum number of times you can run a dungeon in a day. You can f do a dungeon an unlimited amount of times if you want to. It's not like WoW where you can only do a dungeon X number of times per day or you get raid locked out of trials or anything which I'll cover in the next section. You can do trials and dungeons as many times per day as you'd like. The next thing that I'm going to cover is Trials. So Trials are the Elder Scrolls Online's version of the raid that you would see from other games. So the way that Trials work in ESO is that there are 12 members in a Trials group. And the ratio of tanks to healers to DPS does kind of vary from trial to trial. But the general rule of thumb is going to be two tanks, 
two healers, and eight DPS. Some uh, trials require three tanks, some trials only require one, and you kind of flex in and out the DPS as needed. But they are 12-man groups, so it's basically like, for those of you who have no idea what a raid is from another game, it's basically like a hard dungeon that I described in the previous section. So... Dungeons are, you know, four-player things that you have to tackle together, you know, where you have to dive in and take on all these different mobs and take off the bosses and picture that, but just harder, and that's what a trial is. And there are two types of trials in the Elder Scrolls Online. There's a full trial as well as the more arena-style trials. Now, a full trial is basically, like I said, a super hard dungeon with different mob packs that you have to take on. You have uh, different bosses that you have to fight, etc. The arena trials, on the other hand, generally have no to minimal ad packs and mainly focus on the boss fights and for those trials you can choose to either take on each boss individually or go straight to the final area and fight all of the bosses at the same time so obviously the uh, the higher number of bosses you choose to fight in that final fight the harder that encounter will be now, there is no queue system for trials like there is for dungeons. You basically just have to find a guild or a group and get together and go and do the trials. And obviously, uh, finding a guild is a really easy way to, to get into trials. Or you could go into Craglorn Zone Chat and ask for... Um, Ask for people to, to, to run trials. There's always pickup groups going. And also similarly to dungeons, there is a hard mode for the veteran modes as veteran and normal trials. And the hard mode for veteran is exactly what it sounds like. The final boss will be much more difficult, have more mechanics, have more health, more damage, etc. that you have to take on. And for the first time with Sunspire... All of the different dungeons, or excuse me, all the different bosses will have their own unique hard mode, not just the final boss. So you can choose to do a hard mode version of each individual boss inside of Sunspire, and Sunspire is also a full trial. So, like I said, trials, 12 members, usually it's two tanks, eight DPS, and two healers. And it is basically your raid for the Elder Scrolls Online. The next thing that we are going to cover is synergies. So synergies are ways that group members can interact with certain skills casted by allies. So just to show an example of that, we have the standard of might from the ardent flame line of the Dragon Knight class. And if you look at that last paragraph, it says an ally near the standard can activate the shackle synergy, dealing 10k flame damage to enemies in the area and immobilizing them for five seconds. So basically, it's just a way that allies can interact with skills that you cast. Now, not all skills have synergies. It will denote in the tooltip whether or not it has a synergy and a Basically, like a prompt will come up on your ally's screen that says, you know, it'll say like the default key bind that you have and it'll say shackle and you can click it and it will use the synergy. So I absolutely recommend using synergies when they pop up since they just add a ton more damage to your group as well as can also offer some defensive properties or resource sustain. The next thing that I'm going to cover is the justice system inside of the Elder Scrolls Online. So just like other Elder Scrolls games, you don't always have to be the hero and be the good guy. You can go on a large murdering spree or become a thief and steal stuff from people and generally be a more uh, villainous type of character. But obviously, if you do that, it will come with some consequences. So if you trespass and get caught by somebody, or if you steal something, you will accrue a gold bounty and the item that you steal will be marked as a stolen good. Then if you get accosted by a guard, you could either choose to fight and flee, or you can just pay the bounty and lose those stolen goods. But uh, doing other things like obviously murdering somebody in the center of a town where everyone sees will cause the guards to be attack on site. Your bounty will be a tad bit higher, and you will uh, have to basically die at that point in order to clear your bounty or wait until the attack on site goes away, and then you'll just be accosted like normally. Now, don't think that just because if you choose to get killed by a guard, you save the gold if you do die with that bounty on you and you have the gold available the gold will be taken from you automatically and the guards are insanely hard to kill you're not going to be solo in any guards they are basically impossible to kill so uh yeah you need to keep that in mind but 
if you get this huge bounty or you get all these stolen goods and you want to actually do something with them, there is a place you can go to, and that is the Outlaw's Refuge, which is noted by this icon on the map. So if you go to the Outlaw's Refuge, there are fences in the Outlaw's Refuge that you can uh, talk to that you can sell your stolen go goods to, because just like in Skyrim and other games, your more uh, trustworthy merchants don't want your stolen items. But if you want to sell them to a fence, you can absolutely do that to get some gold for those items. Or you could also launder the items and keep them for yourself. Also, you could come to the Outlaw's Refuge and have them pay off your bounty for you if you don't want to pay it to the guards and lose all your stuff. Because if you pay off the bounty of the guards, you do lose your stuff. But if you want to be able to just, you know, keep that stuff, but, you know, not constantly be attacked, then you could talk to the fence and do it for you. So store fence. And like I said, you can choose to sell or launder. Launder lets you keep the item. Selling you basically allows you to sell it. And there is a cap, though, on the item of num uh, items that you can sell or launder per period of time. So that is something to keep in mind. But... Uh, that is basically a quick overview of the justice system as well as the Outlaw's Refuge. Obviously, no one here in the Outlaw's Refuge will attack you, so if you have a bounty, this is a safe place to go. There's also, uh, in a lot of them, there's banks, there is uh, general goods merchants, there are some guild traders as well, uh, which I went over in an earlier section, but... And do keep in mind that certain necromancer skills will anger justice NPCs and cause you to be attack on site and accrue a bounty. But those skills have a note on them that tell you whether or not it will cause you to anger a justice NPC. The next thing that we are going to cover is housing. ESO has a really robust player housing system that in my opinion is very 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 well done and people get super into housing there are literally people in the game whose entire end game journey is just making houses so you can do a ton with this system you could also use houses to basically act as a guild headquarters as well so it uh, by allowing guild members to travel to and from your house. So it's a really, really robust system that has a lot to offer. So if you want to take a look at houses you do have, you can go to your collections, go to the housing tab, and you can see houses that you've collected and houses that you have not. You can also go to these houses and preview them and see what they look like furnished and unfurnished. And speaking of that, you can buy the house either furnished or unfurnished with either gold or crowns. So obviously the ones that are furnished will be a bit more expensive than ones that are not. Most houses are available for either um, gold or crowns, uh, but some are crowns only, something to keep in mind. Uh, and some also require an achievement in order to purchase them. So again, something to something to keep in mind. But you can get really, really, really robust with your uh, with your houses. You can actually put Mundus stones in your house. So if you want to, you know, not have to travel all around the world in order to use a Mundus stone, you can put a bunch in your house. You could also put target dummies in your house. So I know that if you ever want to do like a damage parse and see how much damage you're doing, you can put target dummies inside your house. You can also put crafting tables inside your house as well. For the variety of crafting professions, including specific set tables, which allow you to uh, craft certain item sets. Uh, you can also, in addition, put a banker and a general merchant. So you can put a banker NPC inside your house to allow you to access your bank. You could also put storage chests, which give you some more player storage inside your actual house, similar to Skyrim. You can also, like I said, uh, put like an outfit station inside your house. You can put a transmutation station inside your house, which I'll be going over a little bit later in the guide. Uh, you can put the, the general merchant inside your house. So if you want to uh, sell stuff to the merchant, you know, that you have in your inventory, you can feel free to do that. So there's a lot that you can do with the housing inside of ESO. You can actually even put busts or... Um, uh, what's it called? Trophy statues from certain dungeons and raids that you've been in. You get certain crown store exclusive statues that you can put inside your house. You could also get a music box that will play certain songs from the Elder Scrolls Online's uh, soundtrack. There's just a lot of different stuff that you can get. You can really get crazy with customizing your house. But like I said, you want to check out the... Uh, if you want to also get a free apartment, you can get a free one as well. There will be something on the crown store. Um, I for, it's like a free brochure that you can get. Uh, if I go to my quest log, I should still have it on this guy. It's called, I believe it's called a friend in need. So if you see that quest line in the crown store, you can get a basic apartment in a city for free. Uh, but like I said, some of these larger, more larger houses are going to have a gold cost or cost crowns. But 
you can get really in depth with your ESO player housing and there's a lot of variety and customization at your fingertips. The next thing that we are going to cover is combat basics. All the little basic things of combat so that you know what you're doing when you're actually fighting stuff. So a lot of mistakes that I see people in ESO make, especially when they first start, is they literally only use what's called light attacks. It's just like left clicking your mouse and this is all they do. They think it's like Skyrim and they just left click until the cows come home. Okay, there's more to ESO combat than just using light attacks. There are also skills that you have at your disposal, which you can see on my bar here at the bottom. So you can combine light attacks and skills to do a variety of different things, place dots on people, have good direct damage, uh, stuff like that. In addition to light attacks, uh, light attacks will obviously deal some damage. They will proc any enchants that are on your weapon. So as you can see, this guy has a flame enchant on his front bar staff. And it will also cause you to generate ultimate, which is the resource to cast ultimate. So constantly putting light attacks inside of your rotation is extremely important. Now, let's say, for example, let me burn some of my magicka here. Let's say you burn your magicka really, really low, okay? And you're like, man, I don't have enough magicka to cast my skills. I'm not sure what to do. You can do a heavy attack, which you charge up by holding the left click and letting it go all the way through. And as you can see, you gain resources. Now, staves will cause you to gain magicka, while melee weapons and bows will cause you to gain stamina upon their heavy attacks. You can also do a medium attack, which is like a halfway in between a light and heavy attack, so it does slightly more damage than a light attack, but doesn't restore the resources like a heavy attack does. You also have blocking. Blocking is done by holding your right click and will mitigate damage coming into you as well as block many projectiles and CCs. So using block at key times is really important. But do keep in mind that blocking does cause stamina as well as stop your stamina regeneration. So as you can see, my stamina is regenerating a little bit here. But if I block, it stops. So you can't just sit and block forever and have your stamina continually regenerate. It will stop regenerating while you're inside a block. And obviously, once you are out of stamina, you can no longer block. You can also do a dodge roll. So dodge rolling will allow you to basically do exactly what it sounds like. Dodge incoming attacks. So if someone's trying to hit you with a long ranged attack or hit you with a hard hitting melee attack, you can dodge roll it and it will cause you to take no damage from it. But you will obviously have to spend some stamina in order to do that. And more uh, concurrent dodge rolls will cost more and more. So you can't just again roll across the entire map. The more you dodge roll, the more the cost is increased until these little green uh, swirlies around your feet when they go away then your dodge roll is back to a normal cost so we have light attacks heavy attacks medium attacks blocking dodge rolling and uh also you have jumping so you can jump around you also have bashing aka interrupts so let's say you're going against a target here and you see some like, kind of like lines flaring out from the center of their body you can do what's called a bash and basically interrupt their cast bashing again costs stamina and will prevent them from uh in you know casting the skill that they are in, that they are doing bashing is also the exact same key for cc break so let's say your character is stunned and you press the bash key or the interrupt key which is known by as the keybind you can break free of any ccs that your character is under and for those of you who do not know um I, what a cc is i will be going over that in a later section but but th that is the basics of combat and you also have your skills so that is the basics of combat you want to you know use all of these things together in order to create a basic flow of combat now we're going to get into it in a bit of an advanced tactic in the next session which is called animation canceling but i recommend that everyone learn animation canceling from their first starts inside of eso so you can build good habits while going through your questing journeys so that come end game you will be ready to play at the best of your abilities The next section that I'm going to cover is animation canceling. Animation canceling is extremely important to basically squeeze out as much damage out of your character as physically possible. And it's something that I recommend that you try to practice from day one. Now, I want to dispel a common myth about animation canceling. First, it is not cheating. Plenty of games have animation canceling in them, and I'm not sure why there's this huge belief that in ESO it is considered cheating. When the game was originally designed by Zoss, 
Animation canceling was not an intended feature that they had, but when they built their engine and put it together, they noticed that animation canceling was a thing. And instead of trying to remove it, they just embraced it and realized that it basically adds a certain skill cap to their combat and allows you to the best of players to make to make and complete multiple actions with inside a global cooldown. So with all that fancy jargon out of the way, it, it, animation canceling is exactly what it sounds like. You basically end an animation first before it goes through its whole thing and you still get your intended desire. So for example, you can cancel light attacks. So instead of doing this whole uh, this whole action here where you bring your staff forward and bring it back, you can cancel off the second part of that animation with another action to basically optimize the number of things you can do in a certain time period. So I think it'll be better if I explain it as well. So we're going to go over some different types of animation canceling here. The first one and the most important is light attack animation canceling. It's basically where you cancel a light attack with a skill. So you would basically, at normal speed, this is what it would look like if you didn't animation cancel. Light attack, skill, light attack, skill. As you can see, it's pretty slow. But if you cancel the animation, so if you use the skill very soon after the light attack, it cuts off that whole entire back part of the animation and look how much quicker it is. You could also do a similar thing with heavy attacks or right before the heavy attacks about to go off. Uh, you're about to bring your staff forward. You could also click a skill as well. Now, besides light attack animation and heavy attack animation canceling, there also is weapon swap canceling, which I believe is the second most important type of animation canceling, where you can cancel a light attack or a skill with a weapon swap. So you can go skill weapon swap, skill weapon swap. But if you did that at full speed, it would look like this. Skill, weapon swap, skill, weapon swap. You see how much slower that is than if you were to cancel the animation and squeeze it inside of a cooldown? You could also combine the previous two that I mentioned. So you can do a canceled light attack with a skill and then combine that with a weapon swap. So you can do light attack skill weapon swap. See how quick that all happens? So that's why learning this at, from a early level is important. But in my opinion, these are the two most important ones is, is light attack canceling and weapon swap canceling. Those will make any player way more efficient than those who are not. But I'll go over some other ones here as well. We also have block canceling. So you could use a skill and then block. Skill and then block. So it'll cancel off the second part of that animation. You also have dodge roll canceling. So you can use a skill and then dodge roll. So as you can see, instead of using a skill and then dodge rolling, you can do skill dodge. Oh, except for I'm out of stamp. <laughs> you can use skill dodge roll. You see how it makes it a bit quicker? And like I said, you can combine all of those various things with the light attack canceling. So you can, if you want to, do light attack skill dodge roll. You see how quickly all that happens as opposed to if you were to go light attack, skill, dodge roll, except for meta stam, you know? So being able to animation cancel will just allow you to do things much quicker. So we did light attack into skills, uh, skills into weapon swaps, skills into blocks, skills into dodge rolls. Uh, I already said weapon swap. And we also have skills into bashes. So you can do a skill into a bash. Skill into a bash. All right. So you could also use bash to cancel skills. And any single time I've mentioned that you can cancel a skill with something, you can also cancel a light attack with it. So if you want to, you could always light attack weapon swap. But generally, the most efficient way to do it is to use a light attack into a skill into another action for the animation canceling. But like I said, the most common one that you will do as 99% of players that what you're going to want to do is mainly focus on the light attacks and the skills and the skills into the weapon swaps. If you can nail those two things down, you will be a very efficient player and much further ahead of those who are choosing to not learn how to cancel their animations. The next thing that I want to cover really quickly is soul gems and why they are so important. Now, you get soul gems from doing a wide variety of things, from completing dungeons to getting it in your undaunted package from uh, their, your random normal per day. But soul gems are extremely important because they allow you to resurrect any character of any level so if so you know one of your friends dies near you and you have a soul gem you can use that soul gem to revive them or if you die yourself out in the world you can use your soul gem to revive yourself at your current location if you do not have any soul gems on you another player will have to revive you or you will have to revive at the nearest way shrine soul gems also allow you to keep your weapon enchantments because you can enchant your weapons with um 
enchants to make them deal more damage. It enchants, uh, it can recharge those enchants, because as you can see, as you can see, there's a little bar above that fiery weapon enchant I have, and when that runs out, I will no longer have an, inch, uh, an enchantment on my weapon, or basically it won't proc. But I can use the soul gem to recharge the weapon enchantment, and it will be firing off. So you never really need to buy these. If you're just running dungeons regularly, you will have a ton at your disposal, but I just wanted to go over these really quickly so that you guys know how important soul gems are to keep on your character and acquire at all times. This next section is going to cover a lot of different things. We're going to be going over the basics of crafting, certification, research, set bonuses, and motifs. So the first thing we're going to start with is the crafting basics. There are a total of seven different crafting professions in the Elder Scrolls Online. We have alchemy, which deals with the creation of potions, blacksmithing, which deals with heavy armor and metallic weapons, clothing, which deals with medium and light armor, enchanting, which deals with creating enchants for armor, weapons, and jewelry. Jewelry crafting, obviously, is the crafting of jewelry. Provisioning is the creation of buff food and buff drink. And we also have woodworking which is the creation of staves and shields now to get, unlock any of these crafting professions the best way it is to just go to a town and interact with the various crafting tables once you interact with these crafting tables you will unlock that crafting skill line and you can see everything for the skill line in terms of the passive bonuses that you can unlock now the basics behind the crafting will start with uh woodworking blacksmithing and clothing and jewelry crafting is that there are raw materials and you have to basically take these raw materials and refine them into refined materials then using these refined materials you can create a bunch of different items and the more of the type of material you use the higher the level the piece of gear is up until a certain point then you have to go to a new material and as you can see each you know the new materials correspond to a certain level of uh, so through a certain level range of, of item. Then once you have the refined materials and you choose what type of item you want to make, you have to use a style material. And the style material determines what the actual gear piece looks like. And that's where motifs come in. Motifs are basically these little chapters or books that you have to read that make certain gear pieces look a certain way. So for example, if I have the Old Mary Dominion style, I can craft gear that looks of the style of Old Mary Dominion. But I have to use the actual motif to learn the style and then use the style material to create a piece in that style. Also, once you learn a motif, from a certain crafting style, you can then use that motif in the outfit system, which I went over in an earlier section, and that will be unlocked across your entire account. And you do not need the style materials for that. You just simply need to obviously, like I went over in that section, pay some gold. But if you want to actually craft a item looking a certain way, then you need the style material. After that, you have trait material. So you can craft gear with a certain trait. Now, traits I went over a little bit earlier basically are kind of um, bonuses that your weapon or armor gives to you. Now, to create an item of a certain trait, you need to have the actual trait material and you can create the item of that trait. But even before that, you need to do what's called research and you need to research that gear trait in order to be able to craft with that gear trait. Now to research an item, you need to basically acquire an item with the gear trait that you want to research. So let's say training, for example, if I want to create a training bow, I need to acquire a training bow and then basically bring that bow to this crafting table, go to the research tab, click on the uh, training, it'll say researchable over here, and then I can research training for bows, but it will destroy that bow in the process. So it's really important though early on to save up as many different items for researching as possible because doing research from day one is incredibly important. And the reason being is that the research timers get very, very long the more traits you have researched. So for example, the first trait might only take six hours, the second one might only take 12, but your final trait for a certain gear type will take up to 30 days in order to research. So it's extremely important to get this started as early as possible, as well as keep a banked, uh, like to keep items banked to research because you can research items straight from the bank. It's not like you have to have all this stuff sitting in your inventory at all times. 
Now, research and knowing gear traits also goes hand in hand with creating set bonuses. Now, what are set bonuses? So set bonuses are exactly what they sound like. Bonuses that you get for wearing more than one piece of a set. So for example, my Magic of Dragon Knight wears Burning Spell Weave. If I wear one piece of Burning Spell Weave, I don't get any benefit besides just the trait and the enchant. If I wear two pieces, I get a line of Maximum Magicka. If I wear three pieces of Burning Spell Weave, I get Spell Damage. If I wear four, I get Spell Critical. And if I wear five pieces of Burning Spell Weave, I, whenever I deal damage with the Flame Damage ability, I have a 15% chance to apply the Burning Status effects to an enemy and increase my spell damage by 507 for 8 seconds. And this is a set that I got from a dungeon. But you can also craft gear items with gear set bonuses. But in order to craft an item with a certain gear set bonus, you need to have a certain number of traits known. So for example, if I wanted to create a set of the Julianos gear set, which gives two lines of spell critical, a line of max magica, and a big line of spell damage, I would need to have six traits known for every single gear piece that I was trying to create with Julianos. So for example, if I am trying to craft that, we'll just use woodworking for our example here. If I was trying to create a Julianos Inferno staff, I would need to have six different traits known to even be able to create a Juliano staff in the first place and then actually have the trait that I want to create the item with known. If then if I wanted to create an ice staff, I would need to have six different ice staff traits research, etc., etc. So that is why researching from the beginning is extremely important. And research also plays into the transmutation system, which I will be going over a little bit later in this video. Now, in terms of certifications to get certified, in a certain crafting profession. This will allow you to do a daily quest called a writ. And a writ basically gives you inspiration points, which allows you to, uh, which is basically the experience line for crafting. Uh, gaining inspiration means that your crafting gets leveled up. And if you do these writs daily, they will give you some, they'll cost some materials, but they'll give you some gold back, uh, some other materials and stuff, and it'll give you that inspiration points. And it also, when you do the, um, when you do the, training for the certifications you learn the basics about the different types of crafting professions so i would recommend going to uh the mages guild and talking to Danell toleno in order to get the research uh in order to get certified for alchemy provisioning and uh enchanting then you can go to milaneth of the fighters guild to get certified for woodworking blacksmithing and uh clothing and then you can go to uh, the writ area inside of Alinor in Somerset in order to get, uh, there'll be an NPC there that will have a quest that will give you the, uh, certification for jewelry crafting, and you can learn the basics about the different professions there, but... So that, you know, I explained how woodworking, uh, blacksmithing, and clothing work, they all work relatively similarly. Uh, the way that alchemy works is you need to simply combine multiple ingredients together, as well as a solvent in order to create a potion so very very simple then with provisioning you need to oh you need to have a recipe known and then acquire and then use a bunch of different ingredients within that recipe to actually create the food that you need and food is extremely important for your character buff food gives your character a lot of bonuses is extremely important for end game power and then you also have enchantments uh enchanting which basically is the combination of a bunch of different runes i can show you some in my craft bag here uh if you go and combine a bunch of different rune types so you have the uh, an essence rune, a potency rune, and an aspect rune. And then if you use one of each types of these, you will be able to create a uh, an enchant for your gear. And like a more, if you want a more in-depth look at crafting, I have a complete crafting guide on my YouTube channel that I definitely recommend checking out. This video here, I'm just kind of going over the a brief overview of crafting here. But I will say that the best way to level alchemy is to actually create potions. The best way to level provisioning is to create um, food. But for jewelry crafting, enchanting, woodworking, clothing, and blacksmithing, the best way is deconstruction. So basically, you take the items that you don't need from research and you deconstruct them. 
basically you turn them down into raw materials and that is the most efficient way to level up these professions so all that gear that you get from running your dungeons and your quests that you don't need deconstruct them don't just vendor them deconstruct them in order to level up your crafting and now a common question i always get is dots do i need a separate crafting character for my main you absolutely absolutely do not your main can 100 percent be your crafter so basically what you want to do is focus on getting the skill points that you need for your main build passive skills etc and then you can take the rest of them and funnel them into your crafting professions if you so desire even if you don't want to be a crafter though like i said i recommend at the very least doing the researching for jewelry crafting woodworking blacksmithing and clothing because of the transmutation system which i will be going over later in the video The next thing that we are going to be going over is consumables and quick slots. So in addition to the five abilities and the ultimate that you have uh, available to you at all times during combat, you also have a quick slot bar, which allows you to slot potions and other items that some could be used in combat and some can be used out of combat. For example, potions can be used while you are in combat. It basically allows you to restore some resources, get some nice buffs for your character. They're very, very, very important for your end game power and are just a good thing to have. So you can slot these potions on your quick slot. So if you go to your bags, for example, and press the default keybind of Q, you are able to assign, you see, slottable items. You can slot a bunch of different potions if you would like onto your bar in order to gain those benefits. You could also slot buff food onto your bar as well, which again is extremely important for your character's final power. So you can put buff food on your quick slot bar. So that let's say, you know, you're in combat and your buff food wears off, you can reapply it. You can also put different uh, vendors and merchants. For example, you can buy a banker as well as a general merchant from the crown store and you can put those on your quick slot. So that let's say, you know, you're out and adventuring and you go, oh, I need to access my bank. You can just hold Q. Navigate to your banker, summon the banker, and he's there, and then dismiss. So very, very simple. You could also put uh, Siege here for when you're fighting in Cyrodiil. I will be going over PvP in a bit, but you can put Siege here as well so that you can quick access the Siege inside of combat. But that is a quick overview of consumables and quick slots. You have your uh, potions that you can quick slot. You have your buff food. Uh, you also have different convenience items such as the banker as well as siege but if you want to you can explore some other things here that you can put onto your quick slots but like i said bags press q that gives you access while you're out in the world if you want to change hold q and you can select using the mouse from your different quick slot items and these quick slots do have a cooldown so it's not like you can just use them um all the time the quick slot potions have a cooldown uh of 45 seconds but otherwise you know stuff like siege the banker and food does not but it is something to keep in mind when you are using potions from your quick slot menu The next thing that I'm going to cover is the major minor buff system in the Elder Scrolls Online, and this is a very important system to understand if you want to know how buffs and debuffs work. There's two types of buff types and two types of debuff types. We have major and minor. Major, it basically is a lot of an effect, and minor is basically just a little of an effect. But you can only have one instance of any particular major buff on you at the same time, just as you can only have one instance of any minor buff on you at the same time. And I think a better way to explain this would be to actually give you an example. So if we look at Volatile Armor from my Draconic Power skill line from being a Dragon Knight, when I cast a skill, I get Major Resolve and Major Ward, which increases my physical and spell resistance by 50 to 80 for 20 seconds. Now, I can can't have four instances of major resolve on myself at the same time giving me 20k spell resistance it doesn't work that way you can only if I, if I were to slot five skills that gave me major resolve for some reason i would still and would cast it all of them i would still only get 52 80 resistance you can only have one instance of that major resolve buff on you at once okay and it's the same thing for debuffs if i was to use a debuff such as uh let's just use minor def or major defile uh do i have a skill off the top of my head let's just say major defile major defile basically will reduce your healing taken by 30 percent now you can't hit someone with three different major defile debuffs and make their healing reduced by 90 percent you can only have one instance of that major defile debuff act them on the same time but you can't have a major and a minor so for example if i again we're going to talk with volatile armor 5280 
I could also have minor resolve and minor ward, which increases my physical and spell resist. I believe it's like 1320 or 1380. So it's basically like a smaller version of this major buff, but you can have major resolve and minor resolve or major ward and minor ward. But similarly to the major buffs, you cannot have, you know, 15 different minor wards running on you at the same time. Only one instance. So if it's a name, so do keep this in mind that if it is a named buff, like this, you can only have one instance active on your character at the same time. And it's extremely important to optimize your character by not overlapping with these major and minor buffs. Now, I do want to say, I want to mention this really quick. There are one important buff for every Magicka character and then one important buff for every Stamina character. You need to make sure that you get from somewhere when it, you get to end game. For Magicka, that would be Major Sorcery. Wherever you choose to get that from, whether it be potions or whether it be your gear, you need to have an instance of Major Sorcery somewhere in your build as a Magicka Damage Dealer. It increases your spell damage by 20% for 47.6 seconds from this skill. Or if you are Stamina, you want at least one instance of Major Brutality somewhere on your bar. So Major Brutality increases your weapon damage by 20% for 30 seconds. It is incredibly crucial to your build to make sure that you have at least a form of this somewhere in your build. So something to keep in mind while you are playing. But that is just a quick overview of the major and minor buff system. And I hopefully you guys understood how that system works. The next thing that I'm going to cover is player versus player. There are different types of PvP in the Elder Scrolls Online. You have your World PvP in Cyrodiil, your 4v4v4 Battlegrounds PvP, which is instanced, and then you also have Dueling, which is one-on-one -on -one PvP, where you can walk up to somebody out in the world, challenge them to a duel, and then you guys fight. So when you are in PvP, you have a buff active on your character called Battle Spirit, which does have the effectiveness of shields, has the effectiveness of heals, and also gives you some additional health. So do keep in mind that when you do see a lot of PvP builds out there, that Battle Spirit buff is generally taken into account when you are looking at their stats, specifically the health. Now... To get into a little bit of an explanation of PvP, Cyrodiil was the main PvP added in the game back when it was first created. And it's basically where the Daggerfall Covenant, Ebonheart Pact, and the Aldmeri Dominion fight for control over Cyrodiil. So this is your big uh, capturing keeps, capturing outposts, taking resources, going across bridges type of battle. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into Cyrodiil and what it entails. I'm just going to go over some surface level stuff today. If you guys want a good introduction to Cyrodiil, I actually recommend when you go into Cyrodiil, there's going to be a quest uh, giver right when you first enter Cyrodiil that gives you a basic explanation to Cyrodiil and how to move around the map and, and how to get siege and everything. So I highly recommend you do that quest line you do get a skill as well a skill point as well um and you do gain some ap which is alliance points which is the currency that you earn when you pvp and so i recommend doing that quest to understand the basics but like i said ap is what you earn when you pvp so you earn these alliance points you can use these to buy a bunch of different things motifs gear pieces uh crafting materials etc and the big thing that people like to know about when you PvP is Emperor. How do I become the Emperor? So if you want to become the Emperor of Cyrodiil to, to be the leader of Cyrodiil for your faction, your faction needs to hold and take all six keeps around the Imperial City, and you need to be the person on your faction for that campaign with the most alliance points. Now you might be wondering, well, Dots Gaming, what is a campaign? A campaign is basically a fancy word for an instance of Cyrodiil. Not everybody that's in Cyrodiil is, is everyone in the game. They have multiple instances of Cyrodiil uh, to help, you know, not make the maps just like overcrowded and overflowing with people. Now, the way it works in Elsewhere nowadays is that you have a home campaign, and that campaign is the campaign where your actions uh, earn you spots on the leaderboards, and you can also help your alliance towards victory by earning points, you know, capturing keeps, capturing castles, outposts, things like that, and you earn rewards towards your faction for that campaign. At the end of the duration, whether or not it's 30 days or seven, you are able, the winning faction, you know, they win the, the campaign duration, hooray, and the members of that faction who participated and got a certain number of points will get rewards 
for uh, complete, you know, participating in that campaign, then the score is reset and you start all over. Also, every time you earn a, a certain number of alliance points, you are also able to get rewards of the worthy, which are basically little reward caches that you can earn that contain a bunch of gear as well as transmutation stones on the first one per day. I will go over transmutation in the next section. And then every single time you get a certain number of AP, you also can up your reward tier, which basically gives you even better rewards when the campaign ends. You also have your alliance rank, which shows how much you participate in Cyrodiil. It's based off of alliance points earned, gain rank by participating in activities for your alliance in Cyrodiil. Um, and also now with Elsewhere, your home campaign is now faction locked. Your 30-day campaigns are now faction locked. So if you're participating in this, this name will be different. In a new campaign, when you set it as your home campaign, it will warn you that you're locking your faction to that campaign, which means that if you're go entering the new 30-day standard campaign as an Ebonheart Pact member, you will only be able to play Ebonheart Pact members or characters in that campaign for the campaign duration. You can pay AP to change it, or you can uh, change it at the end of a campaign duration, but you are locked for your alliance. These seven-day campaigns, on the other hand, are not alliance locked, and you can enter those as well uh, with any faction that you'd like. And then there's also going to be Imperial City campaigns, and that is the PvP that at the current moment is in the center of Cyrodiil. And that is basically kind of like open world PvP similar to Cyrodiil, but it's kind of more like close quarters, like urban type fighting. And there's PvE mobs in there as well, and you can earn Telvar stones in addition to just AP. So, and that currency can be used to buy a whole bunch of different things. So, it's just a different type of PvP uh, within Cyrodiil that you can participate if you'd like. But it's going to have its own separate campaign that you can enter once elsewhere is live. Now, you might be wondering, well, what's the difference between the 30-day standard and 7-day standard, etc.? So, like I said, at the end of that campaign duration is when these scores reset and rewards are handed out. And so that happens every 30 days for the 30-day campaigns and every 7 days for the 7-day campaigns. Obviously, the rewards from the 30-day are a bit bigger and, and you earn more stuff because the campaign duration is longer. Now, the standard campaigns have champion points enabled and then the non-champ campaigns have no champion points enabled. And then the below 50 campaigns are obviously for people who are below level 50. So that's just a quick overview of, of Cyrodiil. Like I said, I highly recommend that you do the intro quest to Cyrodiil. And I also have a PvP basics guide that dives a little bit more in depth that you're more than welcome to check out on my YouTube channel. Uh, but besides that, we also have Battlegrounds, which can be found by going to the group pane going to battlegrounds uh if you do your first daily battleground per day you're able to get premium battleground supplies as well as a huge boost of experience similar to how you do it with the uh, dungeon finder and there are two different brackets basically there's one uh, level 10 to 49 and then level uh, cp 10 up so as long you know i'd recommend though that if you're in between cp 10 and cp 160 I would recommend waiting until you get to CP 160 so that you can get a full set of gear. Otherwise, you will be queuing against people who are fully decked out in gear and you will not be. So I recommend waiting until you get to gear cap once you pass level 50. But you can do your daily BG to get, like I said, premium battleground supplies. So like gear and other stuff as well as... Um, a boost to experience and then you can also queue for specific battlegrounds if you'd like so you can queue for just deathmatch you can queue for capture the relic which is basically your capture the flag you also have chaos ball which is basically one person grabs a ball and the as long as you hold the ball your team earns points so everybody wants to kill the ball carry and pick up the ball and then you also have domination which is your stereotypical hold the flag and then crazy king which is domination except for the flags continually move around so those are the different types of BGs you can queue for. You can queue by yourself or you can queue with up to a party of four teammates. And then, like I said, you also have dueling where you just walk up to somebody in the world, interact with them and challenge them to a duel. Battle spirit will be enabled. You will also have CP enabled as well because you're just out in the world. And then you guys can duel. And once someone kills the other person, the duel is over. But that is just a quick overview of PvP in the Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, like I said, there's Cyrodiil, the Imperial City dueling as well as battlegrounds and if you do want a more in-depth version and an in-depth look at all these different types of pvp like i said i would check out my pvp basics guide i did just want to kind of go over a surface level of all the different types of pvp here today so that you guys could have an understanding and a rough idea of what you can expect for the elder scrolls online pvp The next section that I'm going to cover is Transmutation. So this was added in the Clockwork City DLC. And Transmutation, in my opinion, is one of the best things that Zoss has ever added to ESO. And this basically allows you to change the trait of a weapon 
gear piece or jewelry item. So whenever you do various activities in the game, you can earn these transmutation crystals. And you need 50 of them to change the trait of an item. So you can either go to the Clockwork City and do uh, get you know do the transmutation there, or you can actually get a transmutation station for your house. And I'm in my house currently, and you can transmute your items at that table. So you basically need to interact with the transmutation station, and you can see your various items and you can transmute them. So for example, if I want to change the trait on my Axe of Hunding's Rage. Uh, actually, I need to do a different one because that one's already nerd-honed. Okay, so we'll, we'll do I'll do my my Bone Pirate's Axe. It's defending. Let's say I want to change it to something else. Once I have 50 Transmutation Stones, I can basically choose from any trait that I have unlocked, and I can trait change it. Now, I, I mentioned in the crafting section that research is incredibly important for transmutation. The reason that it is so important is because you can only trait change items to traits that you have researched. So for example, on this guy, I only have Nernhoned Axes known, so I can't transmute to a Sharpened Axe. I'd have to put this item in my bank, log on to my crafting tune, and transmute my, uh, this axe to Sharpened if I wanted Sharpened on my crafting tune. So th that's why research is so important. Because even if you never want to craft, if you ever are farming for this, you know, this item that's taking you forever to get, and you get it, and it's in the wrong trait, and you don't have anything researched, you're going to be stuck with that bad trait instead of being able to transmute it to a better trait. So make sure that you trans, uh, you do all your research so that you have all of your different traits known. And like I said, once you collect 50 stones up to a maximum cap of 200, if you have ESO plus 100, if you do not, you can then change the trait of your item and it will be shown by this icon if it is transmuted. So you can't transmute an item and then research it on another, on another character. Once you can transmute, once you transmute it, it's bound to you, and the item is uh, cannot be used for anything else like transmutation, but or excuse me, like uh, research. But this system is really, really good. Makes farming items a lot easier, and I definitely recommend uh, always keeping a reservoir of transmutation stones for whenever you want to make a uh, new set of gear. The next thing that I'm going to cover is the best way to level up in the Elder Scrolls Online. So I am of the opinion that for a new player, the best way to level up is to just quest. I, it's just how I how I believe, like how I think. I don't think it's a good idea as a new player to just straight up power grind your character to level 50 and start grinding up CP. Mainly because, you know, your first trip through an MMO... You only get once. You only get that first experience with, you know, that bit of wonder that you have from being in a new world and experiencing the story and learning your character. Like, that That first time only happens once with a, with a new MMORPG. So, I really recommend that you guys just, you know, quest up your first time around, go to the different zones, explore some of the story, you know, queue your daily dungeons, queue your daily battlegrounds, and just... Have a good time and take your time. That's no rush to end game. ESO is not a theme park MMO, so there's so much you can do even as a lower level player. It's it's the journey, the leveling journey in ESO is actually one of the best in my opinion. It's not like WoW where it's just like you know go get me ten more husks. Like it's 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 a lot better. All the quests are voice acted. You get involved in the story. You have to make decisions in certain quests, and whenever you make those decisions, anytime you walk past certain NPCs, they're like, hey, you're the guy that did this. So it just really adds to the RPG element of the MMORPG that is ESO. But if you're like Dots Gaming, screw off. I don't care. I want to power grind and just get to the end of the game. The best way to do it is to literally just kill mobs. That is the fastest way to grind up. Now, there are a ton of different grinding locations. You can do so many different things. Um, any area that has a high density of mobs will be a really good spot to power grind your character, especially if you are with a friend. If you're with a friend, you guys will gain an XP boost. So as a group of two, go out kill you know find a high density area of mobs and just kill them all and just literally do that until you're the level that you want to be uh you could also do dolmens as well if you do choose to do dolmens i recommend the alakir uh dolmen grind so you basically just go from here and you rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise it sometimes switches but you can just bounce between these three dolmens and they'll be a good way to gain experience power grinding through uh farming mobs is a bit better overlands is better than instanced by the way and but Dolmens is a good secondary option for power grinding. But 
I really do encourage you, if you're a new player, to to give the leveling process a try through questing. I think you'll have a much greater time that way. And plus, I think you'll learn your character a little bit better if you actually just progress, you know, pick up the skills slowly, get your passives, you know, kind of quest out, you know, and play with your skills as opposed to just power grinding, getting to max level with all these skills and being like, I don't know what to do. Plus... Whenever you do choose to level through questing, you're going to discover lore books throughout your questing adventures, sky shards throughout your questing adventures, way shrines throughout your questing adventures, and if you're just power grinding, you have to do all of those grinds separately uh, after, after you just do your power grind. So that is something to keep in mind. Also, I did mention the guilds in an earlier section. Make sure you pick up your Mage's Guild, Fighter's Guild, and Undaunted first thing when you create a character. I want to mention that here in this section just so that, you know, people here are looking for good ways to level. Make sure that you check, you get those three guilds first since they're very instrumental to your character's power and it's going to be easier to get them leveled up while you're leveling than if you just try to, if you grind them separately afterwards, it can be kind of a pain. Trust me, I've done it before and it can get pretty boring. But hopefully, uh, you know, you guys choose whatever leveling process works best for you and that you think you'll enjoy most. And these are some of the best ways to level up in ESO. The next thing that I'm going to cover is the best way to make gold in ESO. There are so many different ways to make money in this game. There, there are there are tons of different ways, and I'm not gonna say like there's one necessarily best way, or there's one this, there's one that. Like there's so many different ways in this game that you can make gold. But the one thing I do want to highlight is doing writs that I did mention those daily crafting quests that I mentioned in the crafting section. Doing writs is incredibly important, especially once you're a max level crafter, because you can get a ton of different materials from doing writs that you can sell for a good profit. You could also get these things called master writs that are really, really heavily desired by end game crafters, and you can sell those for a pretty penny. So doing your writs every day is extremely important for gold generation. You could also do item flipping. I have a guide on my YouTube channel about item flipping. It's no surprise that in an MMO that there's a very good way of making money. In an ESO, there's tons of add-ons that make it easier as well. So you can go check out that guide if you want to learn how to flip items. You could also just farm raw materials. I have a couple different farming routes as well on my YouTube channel and website that you could check out. Um, and then... You know, you can get, you know, sell motifs that you loot from various places that you get from dungeons. You can turn your AP into various motifs or gear pieces as well and sell those. There, There is an infinite amount of ways to make money. But especially while you're leveling, I just recommend, you know, selling ornate items, which are items that can be vendored for a higher amount. And while you're deconstructing items um, and you're getting all of these nice uh, crafting materials, th stuff that you feel that you don't need, feel free to just sell it on a guild trader and you can make some good money throughout your leveling process process but le making gold in ESO it's a, it's a very, it's a wide range of things to do so just find your favorite method pick it and go and go run with it but these are some of the, my favorites personally the ones that I mentioned here you could also farm Telvar inside of Imperial City if you are uh, at the end of the game in PvPing so if you want to see a Telvar farming guide you could check out my YouTube channel as well so check I, I just recommend you check out the guides on my YouTube channel and you know listen to some of the other stuff I recommended in this section and you'll be sitting on a nice pile of gold in no time The next thing that I'm going to cover are the best builds for leveling and end game. So for those of you who haven't figured it out by now from watching this video, I do have a website, dotsgaming.com, and I have a bunch of written guides on this website. A lot of my guides are featured here. Uh, like I said, you got your beginner guides, your general guides, add-on guides. We have an acronym dictionary for, for in-game jargon. We have gold guides, veteran dungeon guides, but the part that I want to highlight for this section is our builds. I have builds for for every class and every role for PvP and PvE. But if you're a new player, I recommend checking out especially my leveling builds. Now, a lot of leveling builds that I've seen prior to me making mine were just like, hey, use these skills and you'll be fine. And in my opinion, static leveling builds are pretty dumb because you don't get to explore your class and experience what your class has to offer and try out all these different skills. And, and leveling with a static bar, a bar rotation, in my opinion, is pretty boring. So what I basically did was I went through all of the different classes and 
I went over how you guys should just set them up in a rough way. So recommended races, recommended gear setups, recommended attribute placements, recommended vampire versus werewolf, a recommended Mundus stone, recommended potions and food, and then a list of potential abilities that you can use on your character. So I know the common question I always get with this is Dots Gaming. There's more skills here than I could fit on my bar. Which one should I use? The answer is whichever ones you want. Pick from this list and put the skills on your bars that you think are the most fun and that you will enjoy the most. That I want you guys to explore what your class has to offer in terms of skills. And instead of me just telling you, use this, it's the best. If you go and pick from this list of skills, you're going to learn why maybe certain skills are stronger than others. And why I recommend maybe taking this over something else. And, you know, maybe you're like, okay, I actually like this bar layout instead of this bar layout. So I recommend that when you're leveling up to check out my leveling builds. I have one for every single class, every role, Magic and DPS. Yes, stamina DPS, tank, and healer. Give the introduction a read, the video a watch, and then read through your section, read through everything. I explained it all very, very well. I even go over passives to get, general rotation. So I recommend for your leveling process to check out these builds. They've helped hundreds and thousands of people throughout their leveling journeys in ESO. So I definitely recommend checking them out. And then once you hit champion point 160, you can come and choose one of a, bu a build that you want, either PvP or PvE. Yes, you can have two builds on one character. And so let's say you come and you go, okay, I want a end game PvP build. So you can click your PvE PvP build and choose from the list of builds that we have here. We have a, a whole bunch of different Dragonite builds, Nightblade, Sork, Templar, and Warden. And then coming with elsewhere, I will have Necromancer builds posted on the website. And do keep in mind that I have not written every single build on my website. Um, I have had members of my community help me out with some of the build writings. Um, you know, if I maybe don't play a certain class or someone wants to share a really cool build that I like and I know them, um, I'll give them the opportunity to, to put it up on my website, you know benefits me by having more content on the site and benefits them by giving them some exposure but you can see at the top it will say build written by and it'll tell you the author and then if you want to contact anyone asking any questions about the builds feel free to click this contact info section and it will tell you uh to join our discord server and ask that writer about the build but you know you can choose again between various pvp builds pve builds we go over everything from you know your your gear setup attributes skills champion points Buffoon, Mundus, Race, Potions, Passive, Tips, you know, tons of different stuff. So you can be sure that your character will be outfitted with some amazing builds for both PvP and PvE by using the ones on DotsGaming.com. The next thing that I'm going to cover really quick are weekly vendors. So you have two different vendors that appear every single week from Friday to Sunday that offer different things. So you have the Alliance Point vendor, which is more commonly known as the Golden Vendor, and that is located in the base camp of every faction in Cyrodiil. The vendor will spawn on Friday and despawn on Sunday. She will sell monster set shoulders in epic rarity. I will be going over monster sets a little bit more in the Undaunted Pledges section. And they have the trait options of Impenetrable or Infused, and she will also sell legendary overlands and dungeon jewelry with the trait either being arcane, healthy, or robust. And the items that she sells will vary from week to week. The luxury furniture vendor will also sell nice furnishing items that, again, will vary week to week for your in-game house. And they will also, like I said, spawn Friday and despawn on Sunday with his goods again changing every week. And he will be located in Cicero's Food and General Goods Shop inside of the hollow city of Cold Harbor. So be sure to be uh, check out these vendors weekly to know what loot they have and what items you can buy if you're interested. And if you join my Discord server, link in the description below, we have an ESO news tab where you can see every week what items are being offered by these vendors. The next thing that I'm going to cover are Undaunted Pledges as well as Monster Helm sets. Now, Undaunted Pledges are daily dungeon quests that you can get from the Undaunted Enclave at any capital city, so Mornhold, Elden Root, or Wayrest, once you hit level 45. Now, these qu daily quests are incredibly important to do because you get Undaunted keys from them. But before I get into that, basically you have Urglark Chiefbane, Maj Al Ragath, as well as Glirian the Redbeard. And these guys will give you daily quests to go and beat a certain dungeon on either normal or veteran difficulty and the reward is like i said those undaunted keys if you beat it on normal vet uh, normal difficulty you get one key veteran difficulty also only rewards one key or you could also do it on veteran hard mode and that will give you two keys now 
Maj and Glarian will have the base game dungeon quest, while Erglarg is the DLC dungeon quest giver every day. Now, basically, when you get these keys, you can use them to unlock these various chests, and these chests have a chance to give you a monster set shoulder from the dungeons that they give quests for. You can simply do a Google search, you can find charts based off of what gear sets are in each chest, but you basically can take the keys, unlock the chest, and you get an undaunted shoulder piece. Now, those get paired with a health to make a two complete two-piece set bonus and you get the helmet from doing the dungeons on veteran mode and the final boss will drop a uh, helmet for the for its dungeon so there's a uh, associated monster helmet for every dungeon so you get the shoulder from these chests by doing the daily quest and you get the helmet from the veteran dungeons but I would recommend for new players, save your undaunted keys until your CP 160. I went over in the CP system section that champion point level 160 is gear cap. And it's important to say, you know, start doing these pledges every day from level 45 to CP 160. Save up all of those keys. And then once you hit gear cap, unlock all of these various chests and you will be able to have a ton of end game monster helm shoulders at your disposal that you can then uh, you know, you can then go out and search and get the monster helms for the associated sets that you want to keep for your character. But this was just a quick overview of Undaunted Pledges as well as monster sets. So these are very, very important. So make sure you get them done every day. The next section is going to cover the arenas inside of Elder Scrolls Online. Maelstrom Arena, Dragon Star Arena, and Black Rose Prison. So, the Maelstrom Arena is... Uh, acquired through getting the Arsenium DLC and the Black Rose Prison Arena is gotten from the Merkmire DLC and Dragon Star Arena is part of the base game. Now these various arenas offer different types of weapons when you beat them on veteran mode, which is why they're so good. Dragon Star Arena, which is located in Northwestern Craglorn, will give you the master's weapons for beating it on difficulty. You have a chance for a master weapon drop. The Maelstrom Arena located in Northeast Rothgar has a chance on veteran mode, or uh, excuse me, will on veteran mode drop the veteran maelstrom arena weapons and then the black rose prison in Merkmire, in Western Merkmire, will give you the Black Rose weapons. Except for the Black Rose Prison can drop weapons on normal. The other two arenas do not, but Black Rose Prison can drop weapons on normal. And the weapons that you get from Black Rose on Vet will be slightly better than the ones you get from normal. Black Rose Prison and Dragon Star Arena are four-player instances that are completed together. Think of it as kind of like a cross between a raid and a dungeon, where there's different stages that you have to, and different levels that you have to do, go through. Each level has certain rounds and certain specific mechanics to it. Now, Veteran Maelstrom Arena is similar to those two, but it is a solo instance. So, Maelstrom Arena is basically the hardest solo thing that you can do in the game, and is basically a rite of passage for learning your character and getting the VMA weapons, which are incredibly important for character power, especially for damage dealers but these are the three different arenas in the game like i said they each offer a unique weapon type through but through doing them black rose and dragon star are done with group members while maelstrom arena is a solo challenge the next thing that i'm going to cover is crowd control there are two different types of crowd control in the game hard cc and soft CC. So basically a hard CC is something that completely prevents your character from making any action unless you CC break it. That would be basically like something like fossilize. Stunning them for three seconds. When somebody is stunned, they are hard CC. They cannot do any, and complete any actions until they can see until they CC break out of that stun. You also then have soft CC, which is something that basically controls your character a bit, but you're still able to complete actions. So if you're rooted, for example, that is a soft CC. You can still play your character, but your character's movement is restricted until you dodge roll out of that root. And then you also have something like a snare, which slows your character's movement, but you can still, again, you can still, you know, do actions and complete actions. And there are different immunities for these. There is a hard CC immunity. So once you CC break, you're immune to hard CCs for a short time. And once you get out of a root, you're immune to soft CCs for a short time. This was introduced in the Elsewhere chapter, actually. 
Um, so there's a wide variety of CCs in the game. I just wanted to basically mention that they exist because some people don't know what that acronym means. It stands for crowd control. And specifically for PvP, you always want to make sure that you have some sort of hard CC somewhere on your bar so that you can stun your opponents and prevent them from completing their actions. The next thing that I'm going to cover are dolmens, geysers, and dragon attacks. These are simp uh, these are basically kind of like world events that occur when you are exploring a zone. So a dolmen is basically uh, kind of associated with the main original quest line of, of Tamriel, where you have to defeat Molag Ball, where he basically summon, you know, he has followers basically have dark anchors summon and root themselves in from the sky, and they basically summon a bunch of Daedra. Now, you and your allies have to kill all those Daedra going through various waves, and the more people that are there, the harder that the bosses are and you guys basically just work through and kill the various danger that are there and when you're done you get a reward for uh a chest reward that ha gives you some like jewelry or some set gear reward for beating the uh the dolmen you also have geysers which are basically really similar to dolmens but they are in somerset and these are a bit unique the mob encounters are a little bit different and you get gear set rewards as opposed to just being purely jewelry uh so you can get you know geysers are basically just the somerset version of the dolmen they're not associated with molek ball but are instead associated with the quest line in Somerset. And then finally coming with elsewhere, I'm on the live server right now, so I can't show it. There will be dragon attacks in the game. And think of dragon attacks kind of like a mobile dolmen or a geyser. Dragons will be flying around and eventually they will begin to land and interact with players and players can fight the dragons there and they will definitely need a group to get those done. And you guys can fight and kill the various dragons in the game. And they each have their own various mechanics based off of the dragons type. But the cool thing about this stuff is these are all events that occur in the world, so when you're exploring and going throughout your adventures, if you stumble upon these, you and your allies can take care of all of these monsters and get some cool rewards for doing so. The next thing that I'm going to cover is the zone guide. The zone guide was added in Wrath Zone, in my opinion, was one of the greatest additions to the game. The zone guide basically shows you all of the things in the zone that you can do and help you identify where you need to go to, to start on that zone storyline so that you're not doing side quests thinking, okay, I'm actually doing the story quest, but in reality, you're just doing some random side quest. So it shows you a bunch of different things that you've completed on the map, such as public dungeons, world bosses, uh, you've gotten way shrines, different delves you've explored, um, and as well as the story quests. And if you've won, and as well as some achievements for the zone. And what's cool is that if you want to do a story quest for the zone, you can simply do continue stones zone story or start zone story, and it'll show you on your map where you need to go to actually go on your zone story. So it really, really helps you guide you through each zone and show you, you know, okay, these are what the things that you need to do. These are some things that you haven't acquired yet or areas that you haven't explored. So it's a really, really helpful way if you're going into a new zone and you don't know where to start to get you started on your adventures inside of that zone. All right, friends, that is it for my Elder Scrolls Online Complete Beginner Guide updated for the Elsewhere chapter. I really hope you guys enjoyed this. I put a lot of time and a lot of effort into making this guide as good as I physically can. I know Elsewhere has been a huge, huge, huge thing for ESO as a game, and there's a lot of new players coming into the game, especially with other MMOs bleeding players at the moment. So I really wanted to do my best to give you guys an awesome beginner guide that you can watch and tab through to really help you get started in your adventures. ESO is a really, really fun game with a lot of depth and complexity to it. Don't oversaturate your brain with information. Just, you know, give yourself time to actually play and explore the game and be sure to research things as they come up and as you want to learn about them but i did try to make this guide a little bit shorter and a little bit less in depth for my guide last year i really loved my guide from last year but i felt that i did go a little too deep into certain topics so with certain things i tried to stay a little bit more surface level and just give you guys the basics and if you want to dive a little bit deeper into certain topics you can feel free to look at the solo videos and guides on my youtube channel youtube.com slash dots gaming as well as my website dotsgaming.com. So I just want to give you guys a huge thanks for making it to the end of this video. If you watched the whole thing, I really appreciate it. And I hope you had a great time watching it. If you guys also want to, you know, see me live on Twitch, feel free to stop by the Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash dots gaming. If you guys want to support what I do here on the YouTube channel, Twitch stream, and my website, feel free to check out my Patreon in the description below. And you can 
give me some support and get some fee uh, get some perks as well for starting at as little as one dollar. You could also join the YouTube channel by clicking the join button below this video and give yourself some perks for five dollars a month. You could basically get early access to all of my YouTube content a week before the general public, and you also get some cool roles in Discord. But Guys, I really appreciate it. I, I love making this video every year. It, it's it's always a pleasure to be able to do this and help the beginners of the game really get started off on the right foot. And I, I just really appreciate you guys. If you're here at the, uh, the outro at this point, it means you probably watched the majority of the video. So I really, really appreciate you sitting through it and watching it. And I hope that you got a lot from each section. And if you have any questions, do not hesitate to leave them in the comment section below. And I will do my best to answer them. For more great ESO content, please be sure to hit the sub button as well as hit the bell to keep notifications on smack the like button if you like this video and definitely if you have new friends getting into the elder scrolls online please share this video with them to help them get started on their new journey into tamriel with armed and ready with the knowledge that they need so thank you guys so much for stopping by i really appreciate it as always i'm dots gaming and i'll see you all in the next video